Alderman Roy Wesley? Here. Alderman Sorrentino? Here. Alderman Jacob? Here. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Here. Alderman Catalano? Here. Alderman Sismarski? Here. Alderman Messina? Here. Alderman Woods? Here. Next, uh, I'd like to uh, approve the me regular meeting Hello. minutes of November 9th, 2017. Second. Any questions? Corrections? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes. Next, report and recommendation, train station sign options. Are we going to do them one at a time, or are we going to take them together, or what do you... I was hoping that we could just do them one at a time so we can get some direction. Excellent. I'll follow you. Perfect. One at a time. Okay. So I'm going to uh, quickly run through. Um, the existing train station sign uh, is shown on the screen. It really is um, a screen for mechanical units at the train station. And looking at it, it does need to be replaced. So we thought it would be a good opportunity to try and um, make it more closely reflect the look of some of the existing signs. So what I've done is I've prepared um, three design options. The first one here uses the existing gateway sign look. The second incorporates the new branding um, concept using monochromatic colors. And then option three is the new brand in color. Um, and so I uh, would like to get some direction from the council regarding the preferred design option for the train station sign and then we'll get into there's another three options to consider. Alderman Eugene Wesley, is there two, two signs like that at the train station? Is there two or one? There is only one. So, uh, I, I do a follow-up. Sure. Okay. So, if we're doing, how come, we, if we're going to do it, why don't we put a sign on the other side? Why don't we put two? Because right now, the only one that sees that sign that we're looking at in the front is the people that use our commuter parking lot. Why would we not promote, on the other side, a sign like that for the people that come down our railroad tracks? We are reusing the existing structure on this particular sign, uh, which is why it's being proposed to be replaced. So the structure will remain intact. It will continue to screen the mechanical units. However, if the council wants to see an additional sign at the train station, we can look at the options for that. This was really to um, attempt to modernize the uh, existing sign that's out there. Mayor, please. Actually, I brought this up uh, with Mr. Cage a few days ago about, I know it's not a sign on the north side facing every park. It's not a budget item uh, price. I was going to recommend something for future, but not even sure because the train station, the way uh, the train goes on an angle in Irving, where the train station sits, if it's even, how visible is it? Even if you put it on the west end of the north side of the building, um, nobody's looked at that yet. I was just going to bring that up. I mentioned it to them, but I'm, I'm in agreement we should. If we're going to brand the city, we should put our name where we can. Uh, but I don't think they're ready for anything like that. I would just Alderman Sismarski? What was, was there a cost to fix to this yet or no? There, there are three cost options, but they have more to do with the less to do with the design and more to do with the illumination options. So we haven't gotten to that really right now. We're just looking for um, direction on the design. What would be the option to make it a smaller put it on both ends of the train station coming and going instead of because like the mayor just said, you can't see that from the street because Christie's is pretty much in the way. But no, you're saying on the opposite side, I'm saying <coughs> both sides of the coming and going on each east and west end of the train station instead. Okay. Kelly, you can take it. Um, so either way we go, we do have to replace this. Um, this screens the mechanical units. And so if we don't want to sign here and we would rather place signs on the east and west end of the train station, we can look at that. Um, but we were looking at replacing the mechanical screening with some updated signage. So if the direction of the council is to provide screen, uh, the um, signage on the east and west end and then just perhaps paint this, we could do that as well. 
Alderman Catalano. I'd like to make a motion to use the option one. Second. Wait, wait. Could you go back to that? Question. We're going to get uh, Alderman Jacob. Uh, uh, going to the, you said the illumination is going to come a little bit later, but option one in here says that it's specifically not non illuminated. So it's, if we go with option one, we can't have it illuminated. Okay. Kelly? Um, so option one, two, and three are related to the design, and so that's what's on the screen here. Um, options A, B, and C have to do with the illumination, and that affects the cost. So for now, we're just looking at options one, two, or three. Mayor, please. Yeah. Uh, on the east and west ends of the train station, you have the small blue metro rail signs. I'm not sure. We've briefly discussed it, but we're not even sure if Metro's going to let you take those off. It's more about the north side. I know what you're talking about, Christie's. That's why I said on the west end of the mm -hmm. building, let's face it, if you're coming from the east going west, you're not going to see it unless you're stopped by the train. It would only be for traffic going eastbound on Irving Park. And again, you have to check the angle and see if it's even a feasible sign that will actually give you proper signage. I mean, it might not even be correct on the angle. We'd have to take a look. Mr. Cage. Um, these are excellent points. The reason we started with, with this one um, is the existing one's faded, so we wanted to screen it. I think these are things that you know, we're he he hearing loud and clear from the council that we want to look at some other options on some other sides. We'll have to engage Metra, and that's something we could bring back at a future date. Okay. Good, so we have a motion and a second for op Mayor, please. You have another question? Okay, we have a motion and a second for number one, but are we looking at option A, non illuminated, or are we going for B or C? Well, we'll do one and then we'll do the other. Two separate motions on, I thought this right. just she said it was sign. two separate. That's why. Oh, I thought you're talking about the yeah. city sign versus the train station sign was two separate. Okay, this you want to make separate as well. Okay, got it. Sorry, I misunderstood. That's okay. Okay, so we have a motion. Alderman Eugene Wesley. So we're going only going to do the one sign, but I Correct. always I always learn when you go big, you get a better price. Okay, so are we just going to prove this tonight and then look and see what the other price, if we can even do it on the other side, or, I, or what are we doing? Well, I think Mr. Cage summed it up. He'll check with Metro. We'll look into it. and so They're obviously not going to make up the sign tomorrow night. I, I understand. I have no problem with proving this, but I would like this brought back with the other sign, knowing that if you get a price for whatever it's going to cost us, seven grand, if you do two, you might be able to get a better price. Mr. Cage. Uh, that's an excellent point, uh, Alderman Wesley. This is the, we would be working with the same sign company that we do with the entrance signs, um, which went through a bidding process. So they're aware of, um, you know, our, our program and they would need to be competitive with the other signs. Obviously, we'd have to work with Metro, but I completely agree. If we're doing one sign or we're doing more signs, then you get a competitive price. Right. So we'd be looking at that, yes. Mayor, please. Sorry, I should have mentioned also, so since this sign is an existing sign, it has all the brackets and everything. The other sign, we have nothing. You have to start from scratch. We've got to make sure it's braced and how it's going to be, you know, basically Correct. sit up on top. So it would be a different setup as well. It's not just buying another sign and off. Correct. Right. Well, there's other fees involved on the other side, which we don't have right now. Mr. Mermis. Want to chime in? Sure. I vaguely remember the discussion about the signage when we redid the train station, and I don't remember the north or the the west and east, but the north and south conversation I believe was definitely had. And the thought was, you cannot see the sign coming from uh, um, headed west. You couldn't see it headed west, and if you were headed east, you could see it, but only for a short <coughs> amount of time because of the way the tracks uh, uh, run across Irving Park Road there. So it was kind of thought at at the time, well, what's the point? You can only see it for a certain amount of time quickly when headed east, and you can't see it at all when headed west. That was the discussion at the time. 
but we can still put it in. The ones on the west and east sides, I don't remember conversation on those. Alderman Jacob, you have a so, question? Well, I was going to say, I mean, if you have it on the um, north and the south, then you could see it from Christie's, and everybody pulling into Christie's could see the sign as well. Correct. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion, we have a second. <coughs> Roll call. Alderman Roy Wesley. Abstain. Alderman Sorrentino. Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman Messina? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Okay, that passes. So are we going to go into the illumination part of Part B of Part A? <laughs> yes. So this is actually uh, should be relatively simple. So there are three options for illumination. One is to not illuminate. Um, and so you see the price there is about approximately $8,000 to um, have a non-illuminated sign. Option B is to illuminate using the same push-through lettering that we currently have on our gateway signs, which um, puts, pushes the cost to $10,700. And then option C is to illuminate using uh, a more, um, a, a little different uh, method, and that's where you see the O and the P um, are actually routed face, and so that pushes the price just under $10,000. Um, as I mentioned, option B is the, would be consistent with our existing monument sign lettering. Alderman Messina. I'll make a motion to move forward with option B. Second. Nice. Do we have any Alderman Sismarski? Uh, the lighting, is that LED? Or would it be using LED or is that <coughs> incandescent or? Does anybody know what that? I, I'm I'm pretty um, sure it's LED. I would I would prefer it to be LED just for loud. I can double check on that. So, any other questions? We have a motion. We have a second. Roll call. Alderman Roy Wesley. Yes. <coughs> Alderman Sorrentino. Yes. Alderman Jacob. Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley. Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman Messina? Yes. Alderman Woods? <coughs> yes. That passes. So next is the City Hall sign options? Yes. This is two parts or one part? Just so we're all prepared at home. Um, again, I've broken it out into design and then um, some other options in terms of the resolution okay. of the screen. So in terms of um, design and just here is the image of the existing um, sign that we have up front. Um, option one would use the existing gateway uh, appearance uh, and lettering. Option two is again for that monochromatic branding. And then option three again is the new branding um, in color. And again, this is just related to the design of the sign. Alderman Messina. I'd like to make a motion to move forward with option one for the city hall sign. Second. Questions? Alderman Smarsky. Yeah, I guess it's kind of a, I guess, rudimentary question. We're, we're rebranding this town, and we're rebranding it all the same. I don't know why we have other options if we're, you know, the rebranding is the rebranding. That's what we're going with. The Maple Leaf, the Wooddale, that we've done it all over town. Why would we even change? I mean, I understand you're giving us options, but it really doesn't make any sense to, I guess, integrate different styles we're branding in one way right well we're so we're voting for option one anyway so. so we have a motion we have a second do we have any any other questions alderman eugene wesley no, 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 no. That's just the style. Just the style. Right. I'm good. Okay. Oh, good. Sorry. All right. Uh, motion a second. Roll call. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Sorrentino? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Yes. Alderman Messina? Yep. Alderman Woods? Yes. That passes. Next. 
Okay, and so moving on to essentially the resolution, um, and we have three different options for the, well, uh, really two. So when, when the um, memo was prepared, there were three options. Um, option A is to have a 16 millimeter LED board um, with a cost of approximately $52,000. Option B was to uh, repurpose the sign that was new but reused and that sign has since been um, allocated for another project so unfortunately that option is no longer available. However, option C is to then have a 10 millimeter LED board which would leave, uh, result in a cost of approximately $70,000. Um, what I've done is provided a couple option or a couple um, images here to demonstrate the difference in the pitch or um, ultimately what you'll see in terms of resolution. Um, and so you see the density of the, the dots here representative of the difference between the two and, and indicative of, of why the cost is um, different. And so we did have the watch fire truck, which is the manufacturer of the sign, come out. And um, the sign on the top is option A, and that's a 16 millimeter sign. As you can see, you can <coughs> actually identify the, the individual lights um, on there. Um, the one on the bottom is option C, and there is more flexibility with a higher resolution sign. So while they were not able to put um, this design on the 16 millimeter board, there would be some limitations in terms of what you could um, display. Um, however, the cost is, is obviously much more for the 10 millimeter sign, but there's much more flexibility and the uh, resolution is better for the 10 millimeter. Alderman Messina. How long have we had the existing sign and how much how much time should we expect out of this one? We had the existing sign since I believe 0506 timeline. Somewhere in there. Alderman Messina. I would assume obviously the construction's gotten better. Could you give the people at home and us an idea of how long we can anticipate since this is gonna be a pretty Whatever we decide tonight, we hope will be around for quite a while, so. Ms. Chrissy? Uh, the sign manufacturer actually states that typically a sign like this will last between 10 and 15 years. Um, however, um, the warranty that um, part of the, the sign purchase is five years and then the installation is, is warranted for a year um, with labor and, and that included. Uh, Alderman Roy Wesley. What project, you mentioned uh, pro the other sign was used for another project. What project was that? There was a project in Joliet for the Rialto Square Theater um, and that never was, re was used. I'm not sure who actually um, purchased that sign from them, but that was the sign that was originally available. Out of Wooddale project. That was option B? That was option B. Okay. Right. <coughs> Alderman Jacob. Make a motion to go with option C. Second. Any questions? Alderman Eugene Wesley. I, I have a couple of questions. So option C, what's the cost on that one? Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you this, this question. They did do a good job. I, I noticed it's landmark signs. Okay. Mr. Bond, since you are here and you are an attorney, since it's over $10,000, doesn't it have to go out for bid? Can you flip back? To, or, because I'm sure there's other companies that make these signs. It, it does not. The signs. Signs. Okay. Mr. Bond. <laughs> It, it does not, and uh, you got a threshold in your in your code. In your code relative to that uh, to that threshold, but you've actually got the municipal code. Uh, there's some exceptions to uh, to that. If you, as a council, determine you don't want to, you don't have to uh, do the public bid uh, with respect to that. But there's also a twenty-five thousand uh, dollar. It's the limit's been increased to twenty-five thousand dollars. Well, they, this is over twenty-five thousand. But again, you're talking about the uh, your <coughs> build, your <coughs> bidding. I don't know what the aggregate is is going to be. You're bidding on the signs, right? Right. But okay. So one comment, and then I'll call some more. But 
So landmark bid on the signs when we bid out for the whole city. These are just add-on signs to that contract, so they, the competition was there. That being said, do uh, you have another follow-up question? Yeah, I, I don't think that to, to bid out the signs, I don't think our city new signs were involved. Our, our electronic signs were in that bid. I don't remember that. No, what I was trying to say is like when we bid out the street and then you add another 10 feet of street, I, you know, because it had exceeded 25,000, we don't go bid out the other 25 feet. So, uh, Alderman or Kelly, you wanna? If I Ms. could, we, we actually did reach out to another sign company to verify that the pricing was in fact competitive and Landmark did have the lower price. What was um, the other company? The other company was Doyle, Doyle Signs. Okay, so. And so their, their price was actually $1,000 more than what Landmark had quoted. So, in t so we did check to make sure that it was in keeping with competitiveness. And, but. and I totally understand checking with it, but it would be nice if someone would told the council, yes, you did check with another company, and this was what Doyle signed. That's not in here. I'm fine with it then. But it, it, in the future, it would be nice if okay. we know that they went out and look, compared. Duly noted. Duly noted. Uh, Alderman Jacob? As far as, the, I mean, the clock tower is going to have a screen like this as well. Is that going to be 16 millimeter or 10 millimeter? Do we know that? Has that been determined yet? That might even be less. That might even yeah, be higher that, resolution. I think so. <coughs> Yeah, that's a different Miss Chrissy. So the distance from which you're viewing um, affects typically the resolution that you sure. need for the type of sign. And so for the clock tower, it's a 40 foot tall structure and it's going to be viewed from a much um, di a greater distance than the sign out front of City Hall. Um, so there may be a difference in terms of the, the pitch for those LED signs than for the City Hall sign. But I don't know specifically what the what the pitch is for those signs. Alderman Roy Wesley. I guess this is to, oh, Brad's not here. Uh, J Jeff, what line does this come under and how much is left in that budget? And Mr. Mermis. Yeah, this sign is budgeted out of uh, the CIP for City Hall Aesthetic um, Program. I believe it was either 125 or 150, no. no. Was it 200? No. No. Summer. That, I no. think that was, that was like for the yeah. train station. Yeah, no, it's City Hall aesthetic is different. That's on, it's a different, yeah, train station, yeah. It was like 150, I believe, 150,000. So have we spent any of that yet? We've spent minimal amounts on little signs here and there, stickers for doors. Um, there hasn't been any big expenditures. We did spend a little money on a preliminary plan that HR <coughs> Green's developing to fix some of the landscaping outside. Um, and that'll cost money to actually do that work, which we'll explain during the CIP process. But we have a lot of money still left in that account for the sign. Okay. Alderman Messina. It's just a basic question. So with C, um, I guess you're calling them pixels or whatever, that there could be the ability for that to get thicker like Option A though, right? Meaning like, I like option, there's gonna be some uses, something we post that, what's, how A is posted thicker font is okay. There's that ability to do that with C, I'm assuming just make it wider, right? I, basic question, but yes. I, I figured, okay. More options. We have a motion, we have a second. No more questions, uh, roll call. Oh, wait, wait, I do go. Oh. <clears throat> Hang on one second, Alderman Sorry. Messina. Have we looked into what the cost would be difference or if there is a difference in the bulb replacement between the two? Same bulb is just more often. Right, so we, we inquired about um, a, an individual panel. They're actually 12 by 12 inch panels that have to be replaced. They're not so individual okay. bulbs. Okay. And so um, essentially, you know, I can't recall what the, the price was. Um, Mr. Cage. Um, I don't know what the, uh, I don't recall what the price was, but essentially, you know, with the, um, the more detailed sign, which is option C, you've got more bulbs. Right. That's you've got more options, hence, you know, it's just like a bigger, better TV, 4K. Um, you get more bang for the buck. What I like about it is that they have the warranty for five years, so we're good on that. 
so that we're not going into something with a short warranty that we've spent a lot of money on. Yeah. And then really it's, you know, up to the council, you know, technology moves quicker and quicker each day. But, you know, the fact that we've had the existing sign out there for quite a considerable amount of time makes me feel good about that because it's, it's a little dated with the colors and now we've, we've shifted with, uh, with the branding. But I think the technology is there. We saw the demonstration today. A is certainly not a bad sign. It's just that you have more options with C and um, it just gives us a lot more flexibility. So yeah. I think the panels that were shown to us essentially just have more of the LED bulbs okay. um, and that there is a cost to replace them, but you know, we have that installation warranty for a year and then the manufacturer for five years. Okay. Alderman Jacob. Uh, Ms. Chrissy, uh, on the bulbs, I mean, if one did burn out, the way I understand it is, like on A, you're going to notice it a lot more than you would on C. So if one burns out on C, we, nobody might not even notice it. I mean, we don't necessarily have to replace it. Versus on A, I mean, you would definitely have to. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, thanks. Mr. Cage? One quick thing to add to that. When we were looking at the demonstration today, each panel, they have, um, I'm not quite sure what the right term is, but there's louvers that protect the, the bulbs. So, you know, um, Someone's driving by, you know, hits a piece of salt or a rock or something, it jumps up. You actually have protection for the bulbs. Uh, it's going to hit one of the louvers and come off, so you have some protections there. But, you know, the, the key is that, the, you know, you have the five-year warranty. So if there's a problem, it will be replaced. Okay. So we have a motion. We have a second. Roll call. Alderman Roy Wesley. Alderman Sorrentino? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman yes. Eugene Wesley? Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Sosmarski? Yes. Alderman Messina? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. That passes. Thank you. Uh, next items to be considered at future meetings, Thorndale Corridor rezoning winter of 2018. Is there anything else somebody would like to? No? Yeah. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Oh. I would like them to come back with those other signs that we talked about for the train station. Come back with a cost for the, right. the other side? Okay. Right. How about if they look at, can we, number one, can we actually even see them? Right. Well, that's fine. From I, the road. I want them All right. to do the So I'm just saying it. so right. that they know both. Right. I All want right. them both. Thanks. Right. Uh, Alderman Smarski? Is there a possibility, like the mayor said, those signs are blue on the... Is there a possibility of calling Metro and saying that we, <coughs> is there a possibility of getting hold of Metro and saying we can redo the sign and rebrand it the way our street signs are? Look into that. We own okay. the building. Yeah. I mean, it's our building, but I know it's their sign. Yeah. Right. We'll, re we'll reach out and Just ask them that would, question, see, see what they the... they say yes or no. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I'll make a motion to adjourn. So move. All in favor? Second. Aye. 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 Opposed? We're adjourned. Public Health Safety, uh, Safety Judici uh, Judiciary and Ethics Committee call to order. Uh, let the uh, minute taker uh, please note that all council members are the same. There's been no change. Uh, I need an approval of the minutes of the meeting. So of second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Questions? Next. Uh, Chief, uh, if you would please get into the... Uh, RVG liquor license. Thank you, sir. Um, so, in the in the recent past, uh, there's been some interest uh, by some elected officials to look into uh, creating a different type of class of liquor license. And what this really stems from is you have some of these parlor uh, gaming locations that want to come in, and uh, what they want to come in with is basically microwave a sandwich, get a liquor license, and really all they are is a video gaming. So, council has. Uh, approved video gaming and we certainly have a number of terminals throughout the city uh, but I, we've worked with the uh, city attorney to come up with uh, something that would allow new restaurants that the city might be interested in coming into town uh, and also have uh, video gaming but also uh, kind of clarify that uh, they need to have a full service restaurant with professional kitchen appliances uh, and that they're not pre-prepared meals that are just heated up. Uh, so uh, there's currently no request that I'm aware of to create a new liquor license. 
Um, but this would allow for if council wanted to open a liquor license, you know, two months down the road for one of the, for a restaurant that has an interest in coming into town, council of course can vote to add additional license, and then the liquor commissioner in his role uh, assigns those licenses to the businesses. So uh, that's essentially uh, the kind of the Cliff Notes version of what we're looking to do here. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Mayor Nunzio. Actually, we do get requests at least twice if not three times a month from okay. different types. I actually got a call yesterday, another cafe, you know, we're going to sell pastries, some sandwiches, and you know, maybe a little <coughs> wine or something on the side, and I go, let me guess, you're going to have video gaming? Of course. I'm like, okay. I go, we're having a discussion tomorrow night, I told them, come up with a great deal. So we get, a, we get requests every week, but monthly, I should say. And council's decision was to, we gave the gambling to our business that's been here. Any of those doubt, any of those other businesses, we've not opened up any liquor licenses. Unless we had one, they had a full kitchen and 3,000 square feet. That's why we're trying to establish the criteria here M moving forward so it's very simple. So why is that? Alderman Sismarski. Yeah, Chief, so you're saying that, that that liquor license for the cafe type sandwich and microwave place you're talking is similar to the restaurant? It, they coincide each other? Do they no. piggyback each other? Or? No, what the goal was, and, and we've had this discussion before, and this came up about two years ago maybe, and the, the thought was, and looked in, looking to other communities, everybody does it slightly different, is if you could put a square footage restriction so it didn't become a gaming parlor, it was really an adjunct, which is what video gaming was intended to be, is, is an amenity to uh, build businesses that have liquor license. But as the mayor said, you've got a lot of these businesses came in and saw, hey, there's some money to be had in the video gaming. The restaurant, you know, that's a lot more uh, staff intensive, labor intensive to cook. You've got that kitchen equipment is very expensive. So this way we'd have just these cafes and they make available, and we've seen a presentation or two at, at this council, they'd make them available where you'd have these pre-prepared meals where somebody would, could get them if they wanted, but they essentially were a gaming parlor. And that's not what the Video Gaming Act was intended to do. And looking at this, to trying to put a restriction on a square footage area, that would impact your existing businesses uh, adversely to have them comply so to, to all their mrs. Smarsky your your inquiry no this does not allow for that in fact this specifically prohibits that from occurring what it does is it gives you if you're inclined to open up the uh, the classifications it gives you control and it requires a full service you've got uh, Woody's just opened up uh, you know recently they've got a full service menu a professional kitchen and we this the chief and I have gone over the criteria professional commercial equi uh, kitchen equipment equipment and the professional commercial kitchen appliances, full service menu, uh, and excluding, specifically excluding those pre-prepared meals, whether it's a pastry, whether it's, you know, those box uh, uh, sandwiches that you can get, those were all intended to be excluded uh, from that, but without impacting, and again, it's got an effective uh, date that would not impact the uh, current businesses, so those that have been uh, following the rules and their liquor licenses in place and, and are in existence, they would not be impacted by this. Alderman Catalano. So how would we classify, like, say, for a deli shop, uh, soup sandwiches or a pizzeria wants to come in? I mean, would that be considered as a full kitchen? Yeah, generally the pizzeria's got a full commercial kitchen um, and, you know, same thing with the, those other types of restaurants that you would uh, suggest. And again, the, 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 and I've seen this in not only this community but in others, there's, a, there's you know, businesses that want to come in and they are not interested in selling sandwiches or pizzas. They're interested in, in gaming, and that's, that's really, you know, that, that's, the council was very clear in that you didn't want to just open this up and allow gaming throughout the city if it's, a, again, an amenity that's part of another business, you know, that's what it was intended to do. But this would, would allow for those types of uses. And I was just going to mention real quick in talking to area police chiefs, not only do they generally rarely sell actual food, uh, but that a lot, and uh, from my understanding, they, they don't sell a lot of alcohol there either. It's primarily just a gaming cafe is what people come in for. Alderman Messina. So just one question, one comment, I guess. So I guess my first question is, is the, rash, the rationale, I'm assuming, is 
this could be flavor of the month, right? Eventually, everybody's opening up gaming cafes. If we, if we just allow them in without having this restriction, essentially, when that loses its, its novelty, you're going to have a lot of empty storefronts. Yes, up front, we probably will benefit. That, that was my first, I guess, question. Is that, is that technically what you see? And then I have a comment after that. Good. Well, it's certainly designed to address the inquiries that the mayor indicated, that he's getting people you know, inquiring about that. And this is a way of regulating those if you do want to allow for certain, it prohibits the, the cafe, the truly just a gaming cafe. This, is, okay. this prohibits that. Um, but you're right. Once the, uh, the you know, if the if the, the uh, allure of that uh, fades, it seems that gambling has been around a long time. But what you don't want to do, and what you have, if you if you don't have some restrictions, is every uh, every one of these video cafes are coming then to video gaming cafes are going to come to Wooddale, and now you've got you know a, a, a proliferation of gambling that didn't exist before as an adjunct to an existing business. You've got an actual that's what you're that's what you're allowing. And this doesn't do that. You have a follow-up? Yes. Okay, go ahead. So at our uh, IML conference, which I find very beneficial for those that are <laughs> out there, uh, I learned that a lot of cities that have done this very well um, have a percentage of their roles, of their revenue roles that come from food. That's not part of this that we're talking about, right? No, so, it is not. Uh, and the reason for that is that's a cumbersome uh, process and then you have to there's a lot of different mathematical factors you know numbers say what you want them to say and so that that becomes a very and I we've looked at the chief and I both looked at the other other code provisions uh, you know some is, issues with getting the, the, uh, the figures from the Department of Revenue so you're getting them from the the uh, owner of the facility you know uh, you know I, I'll give you the the numbers that are going to make it look best uh, for what I need to accomplish so that became very difficult to, uh, to from an enforcement standpoint the chief doesn't want to have to go in there and say let me see your records for today did you sell 65 percent of everything was food you know and, and it's just not it it's, makes it for a difficult from an enforcement standpoint right. and I, I understand what there's an attempt to do is just kind of be neutral on the issue uh, it, you know without discriminating against one type of use or another but you have the right to control the type of businesses that you want in there and, and again video gaming is statutorily authorized for those establishments that they have liquor. The liquor determination is wholly within the province of this city council, whether you want to have additional ones or not. So what this does is it gives you kind of, here's what the requirements are. If you want to come in, you're welcome to come in, but you have to comply with these requirements, and that is you have to really be a restaurant. You can't just be, throw a couple boxes on a shelf in the back, put a, a menu up there, and then just let people come and gam gamble. Thank you. Mayor Police, you got a question? Yeah, I don't, Pat, I don't remember if I mentioned this to you, but subleasing. So, like, I know one restaurant, the owner was approached by one of these groups and says, hey, listen, <coughs> lease the room next door, open up the wall, we'll rent from you and give you a profit of what we, how can we make sure, is there any language we can put in here that somebody can't just rent another 500 feet square feet so they can put in the machines and work out a deal as a sublease type deal. Is there something we can put in here? Well, you've got control over, if I may, sure. Mr. Chairman, you've got control over the liquor license be, uh, with respect to that particular business. So if they're not complying with our rules, they can be, it can no, no. be rescinded. No. Follow up. Let me be clear. I have a restaurant in town. Somebody makes me an offer. It's going to cost me $1,000 to rent another spot here next door to me. He's offered me 1,200 plus 5 percent of his cut of his 35 percent. He's ba I'm basically then subleasing to him. Can we put the restriction? The video gaming has to be run by the person who's holding the liquor <coughs> license. He can't sublease it to somebody else. It should be written in the code. Yeah. 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 That's part of the state. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that, that's covered by the, the Gaming Act right now, and the Gaming Board requires that. Mm -hmm. So if somebody was trying to do that, that would be in violation of state statute. And I, 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 I've, I've heard, heard it. More than once. You and I didn't have that conversation, but I have heard it from other, uh, other communities where that's happened, where they come in and there's somebody's got, we've seen restaurants that have a big 
back room or banquet uh, facility, and they're like, we can use that and, and do it. But it's not it's not allowed under state statute currently. So Sorry. And we do have a provision in here that says it must, in other all other respects, has to comply with the uh, Illinois Municipal Code, the Liquor Control Act of 1934, and our um, the the state municipal code and our our city code as well. So I just want to be clear. So if, if one of our businesses does that, we can yank his liquor license immediately. He's done. Correct. And, and again, that's clear. And the gaming board would, well, if they don't have a liquor license, they don't get uh, video gaming. But, yeah, that would be a violation of the Gaming Act if they let somebody else use that facility for that for a purpose of operating a video gaming. Right. And I was saying a sublease inside their establishment. Basically, the machines are there, but those, the other partner, the silent partner, would take care of it, kind of. That's, so if they, that happens, the other guy loses his license, basically. No. All right, uh, just to get Alderman Jacobs' hand out of my face, I'm going to call him before you, Alderman Woods. Let's go ahead, PD. Uh, a question for uh, the attorney. It, uh, right now, if we did, you know, down the road, if we did want to allow like one one of those cafes into town, can we or we cannot? Because just because you open one doesn't mean we have to open. Because since there's no liquor licenses available. We give it to one person. It doesn't mean we have to open ten of them. Is that correct? Uh, yes and no. It's correct in that you regulate the number of liquor licenses. Once you establish, if you were to allow, let's say, video uh, video cafe, for example, and you allow one in, and someone else comes in and says, "I would, I want one of those," they can't get it unless you authorize two video uh, cafe licenses. So you, as a council, ultimately control it. The risk you run is if you've got that classification and you're allowing that restricting others from engaging in it. if somebody comes in and they've there's some ethnicity to the applicant now all of a sudden did you not give it to me because you didn't open it up to others is it because i'm irish and you didn't want me and we've got a long history and i'm irish so i'll take liberties a long history of uh you know drinking or whatever you know so you got to be careful if you do uh, allow that because then it does open it up for at least the potential for that to happen but ultimately under the municipal code and under your uh, your uh, city code you as a city council regulate the number of, of licenses and the, the classifications the mayor in his capacity as a local liquor commissioner uh, determines if there are licenses available he determines whether or not the applicant is eligible and issue actually issues those licenses that's not a city council function but you would still retain that uh, that ability but again, you have to be cautious in those you grant and those that you deny, if that's the case. Are you done? Alderman Woods? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. As and we discussed this a couple of years back, uh, and I think most people were on board that we weren't interested in having businesses that the, the sole business plan were, were the, was the gambling machines, and, and not, not only to single them out, but because that's a disadvantage to the businesses that already have the machines. Because those people, as Mr. Bond pointed out, uh, from other communities, people go in there and they just play the machine. They don't buy a drink. They don't eat a sandwich. Uh, so, A, you lose that sales tax revenue. But, <coughs> B, those people that would have <coughs> went to another place in town and had to purchase a, a beverage or buy a meal or, or get something, uh, that guy's business starts to fail, too. So these companies are just going to bleed off. That business, as I said years ago, there's only so much disposable income in so many places, and the more places you put up, as you can see, the the, the revenue from that sector doesn't grow uh, parallel to the number of businesses. You know, so if we add one business, the the income might go up a thousand dollars because the one business went on there because he's actually bleeding off from the other companies. So. One last question, Alderman Sismarski. Oh, I'm sorry. I Actually, Don, I, I, Alderman more? Woods just answered it, and it was the uh, same thing. You, you, just, just because you start saturating the town with games doesn't mean you're going to get any more income. You're just going to take from other t other businesses that are here. <coughs> so, I mean, I've never been a big advocate about gaming, so I'm really not for that. All right, well, then uh, I, I know I can't cut anybody from talking. I was just informed, so I'd like to recognize uh, Alderman Wesley, please. Okay. I, I have a – actually – Two questions. So oh, could on. a grocery store, now that they sell meals, 
the grocery store have gambling machines? Knowing, knowing that they do have tables in the grocery store now. Yeah. Chief, would you answer this question? Yeah, this is for the, the codes, the state code says that they have to be uh, for service uh, at the location. So the city would have to allow, let's say, a grocery store to dispense beverages. It's for being consumed on the premises. That's why liquor stores can't just get uh, gaming machines. It has to be consumed on the premises. So if, if a grocery store comes in, and some of them do, that allow for liquor sales, and council wanted to approve that, then they probably could get video gaming, but that would be a council decision. Uh, but just a grocery store, just because they sell liquor, and they have maybe even sell food and have tables there, they don't have a liquor license to consume on the premises, so they wouldn't be able to get video gaming. Okay. Do you have another question? No, I don't. I'm done. Any other questions? Well, before we put this to any motions, this is where it's good to be the chairman. I'd just like to share a few things with our esteemed colleagues here. Uh, first of all, I'm sure you're all familiar with the cafes that are out there, and the names that they carry are of the feminine gender. That's pretty much to take the stigma from a gambling establishment. The demographics of these um, cafes are generally speaking, or not generally speaking, statistically speaking, they're senior females. And there are a lot of families that are hurt by these establishments, a lot of businesses that are hurt by these establishments. And as chairman, I would request that this council raise the bar and not hurt our business owners or our residents and uh, make the motion and the vote in favor of the city. Somebody make a motion? <laughs> oh, were you making a motion, uh, Mayor? Oh. No, I can't make a motion. Oh, I have a question. A I did. Go ahead, sir. No, and nobody made a motion yet. Basically, this code is to stop all these calls we're getting three times a month saying, if you're even going to apply for a liquor license, this is what you need. Okay. Now, some communities have gone where they show you need 1,800, I believe, 1,800 square feet of seating area for your tables, so you can't just rent 500 or 900,000, just 1,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, and um, I think the attorney spoke to that already on why he feels this is good. So this, this is a step in trying to stop this, this nonsense. We've all agreed that we're not opening up licenses for those type of places. This is just something to say, okay, if you're even gonna be considered, do you have a full kitchen, do you have a full menu, right? Am I correct, Mr. Bond, is that, that's, we're stepping, elevating that, the bar here? That's exactly correct. Okay. Alderman Woods. Yeah, for, for one, I was going to say I must have missed something because I didn't read the square footage rule. No, it wasn't in. We okay. Don't, we don't. All right, I was looking, I was fanning for a page. No, no, no. Okay, so, so secondly, I'm looking at the language, and it's minimal, right? It's a paragraph, provided the licensee operates a full-service restaurant with professional commercial kitchen equipment and appliances. So that's, that, that can be, you know, interpreted, right? And in addition to a microwave, uh, and then excluding service of prepared, pre-prepared meals. Well, even a lot of full-service restaurants have pre-prepared stuff. So I, I'm reading this, and I'm like, can I get around this, or do we need to tweak that a little bit? It's a loophole. Uh, Go ahead. Well, we can, and we went over the, the language and recognizing most commercial restaurants have a microwave too because there's some things right. that need to be microwaved. So we didn't want to exclude that and we included that. Um, but the uh, excluding the service of primarily, I can put some language in there, either primarily or exclusively pre-prepared uh, meals. I, I can come up with some limitation uh, language on that. I understand what you're saying because there are some that have their... Well, just if I have a follow-up. Follow-up, yeah, Alderman Woods. Because I'm looking at in some of the smaller restaurants, all they really do have is a commercial refrigerator slash freezer and a flat top, maybe, or a combo flat top grill thing. So some people could argue that's not a full kitchen, or if it is, that's little enough to buy. I'll buy it. I don't have to ever use it or <coughs> buy it or even hook it up because all you're saying is I need the commercial equipment. So it really comes down to the food, the preparation, and 
and, and what that's going to put out. So if you could tweak that. That's all. Mayor, please. Going along with Alderman Woods here. So full, full service kitchen, but right, you have that tabletop grill, a fryer right next to it, and a hood. That's, that's a full service kitchen. Go ahead, sorry, well, the I mean, first of all, it has to be operating. That was one of the provisions in there that's specified. But that's a determination as to whether or not that constitutes whatever minimal uh, cooking you know, surfaces they have. I mean, that would be determined ultimately by, uh, as to whether or not that was legitimately the case. And then ultimately, the if there was a classification for that, it would be the mayor's determination with the assistance of the building department to determine whether or not that would constitute it. That what was <coughs> anticipated was, because what you've mentioned, those are commercial, uh, you know, under the commercial kitchen equipment. That is commercial uh, kitchen equipment. So that would qualify under the language of the, uh, of the proposed code revision. Alderman, did you have a follow-up yeah. there? I mean, but do, when I think of a, I'm thinking they've got the grill top, the fryers, the ovens, <coughs> or they've got a, or they've got a full menu. I mean, they have to produce a full menu that they're they're serving, right? It, it, Right, and, it, and the, the, the full service restaurant is a term of art that, in, that contemplates that, that they have to provide with a, a variety and a range of, uh, of food items uh, that are not primarily pre-prepared. I'll make a motion to approve the Class RVG uh, liquor license uh, with, a, with the attorney making some tweaks on what the menu would consist of. Second. Going back to originally, you guys said like a pizza pizza restaurant is has a big. I mean, a pizza restaurant has an oven. I mean, they don't necessarily have a huge menu. So, could a pizza restaurant apply for this and have the gaming if they wanted, or no? Yes, <coughs> it's got a full service. It's it's got professional <laughs> equipment. Full service for the pizza is going to be the pizza and related items that would qualify. So I think taking what Alderman Jacob is saying is a concern, maybe the mayor as well. When you say full service restaurant, does that constitute a sit in dining option, or can I have a carry out pizza place with you know six machines? But really, like you said, unless we dictate square footage, I could squeeze three, four machines there, and then you just come to my counter and I give you a pizza, kind of like Little Caesars or Domino's. What's that? It's done. Oh, true. Right. Yeah, it, it contemplates uh, uh, dine-in because you're going to, you've got to consume the alcohol on, on the site, premises. Right. Okay. So you'd have to dine in instead of drink and eat your pizza in the parking lot. Yeah, small bar. Right. Yeah. You're good? Yeah, and it, it even says to be sold and consumed on premises. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, just a couple of more facts. The, uh, when this was first brought to the state of Illinois, uh, and other than the full-service restaurants, the other intent were for fraternities, VFWs, and those types of scenarios. However, as always, there's a loophole. And that loophole came, I believe, in the state of Illinois, which we'll all agree it's a big state. There's four, maybe a max of five companies that operate and control these video games. So we're gonna rise above we're going to caulk that loophole and let people know Wooddale's not to be messed with. And I think there's something in the act, Attorney Bond, that said that the revenue must be at minimum 60% food and beverage before any gaming could be considered. They don't want the percentage of gaming being greater than food and beverage. Okay, I'm done. Go ahead. Somebody made a motion and a second. The two U's. Oh, what? The two U's. To create our GM. Motion on the floors. Say it out loud, to, Eileen. To approve the Class RVG liquor license, with uh, including some of the tweaks that we talked about uh, about the food and menu for the restaurants. 
Can we get this guy a chair so he doesn't look like he's sitting on the floor? I keep missing him. I like him. <laughs> All right, motion's made, seconded. Let's have a roll call. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Sorrentino? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman Messina? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. In there, yes. All right. The, um, where am I at here? To be considered at future meetings, this is where I come with the heavy clubs. And Mr. Cage, the shopping centers being in the dark can no longer be because we're going to get a police call and someone has been robbed, raped, murdered, or all of the ugly things that you could think of. And I've been told not to call out centers or names or places, but at Irving and Prospect, it's real dark there at night, real dark. So please, the fines, whatever it is, put it in motion immediately. Alderman Messino. I guess I'd like to add to that in that public safety, you've seen a lot of spikes in carjackings and you know, people are getting pretty relentless. Right. So whatever we can do to address it and quickly. Thank you, I appreciate that. Alderman Catalano? I guess we need to make a policy. That's. I thought we had one. It's no. It should fall under. Okay, well, that'll be for future um, meetings a policy with strict consequences for the lack of. I don't, th I, I don't think you could do that. Why don't you ask the attorney first? I don't think you. On private property. May I, may I Alderman Wesley, sorry I didn't see you. First of all, I, I don't think we need a policy. I believe the building department has authority to go out there and find whatever they have to do be, under, under our building code. So I, I just don't see why we have to make a policy for that. I, I, I agree with you 100%, but time we draw up the policy, time we do it, someone could be jumped and mugged there already. So I think the building department should have authority to just go there and, and wherever this place is at, that's it, hammer it down. You got five days, fix it, or else this happens. I'd like to hear from the city manager. Typically when we mention future items, sometimes the future items aren't necessarily appropriate for council meetings sometimes they are what we do is we take the future item suggestion back take about it at the uh, talk about it at the staff meeting with the attorney with staff see how it's best moved forward if it's not a committee item the item could be addressed easily if it's a committee item then we get some consensus from the council first so we'll take that back and then we'll distinguish where to take it next i want it to be a quickly item it'll wherever it's got to land it'll be on the staff land. meeting agenda on monday perfect any other questions regarding our public health and safety, Alderman Wesley? Mm, forget it now. Why? Could probably a good one. Let's hear it. Well, he's going to ask the attorney if the city has the right to tell public property how much light to go on. It's but that even, goes back to staff not. meeting. So Let, let's not let's answer those let's, let's leave let's, it there. Yeah, let's wait. <laughs> right. Was, did you have anything further with that? No. Okay. We, you better staff. Did we vote yet? For the lights. No, motion to adjourn. <laughs> motion oh. to adjourn. <laughs> like Shirley. All right. Motion to adjourn. Somebody say second. Thank you. All right. All, all in favor. Aye. Aye. <clears throat> We're out of here as far as I go. Thank you all for your participation. We call the Public Works Committee to, committee to order. The minute take or recite the minutes. Uh, everyone's still here. Mm. Same members are still here. Need an approval of minutes from the, the meeting. Public Works Committee, now, uh, November 9, 2017. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? This carries. The report and recommendation the approval of purchase of 20, 2018 Ford F450. Utility truck in the amount of not to exceed fifty-one thousand eight hundred twenty-four dollars. This is my motion. Second. Questions? Alderman Jacob. On the number that you gave for in-house setup, is that an actual? Do we is that a known number or that's an estimate? <clears throat> right. 
I'm sorry. Yeah, um, well, 5,500, it's, it's a rough estimate. It's probably the high end. Um, kind of all depends on what we can reuse from uh, former vehicle. Um, if we need to get a new radio, can we use the old radio? Um, kind of, can we move or some things around? But um, 5,500 is high end, but we, we just spend exactly what we need. Not going over that. Alderman Woods. Why do we need this truck? What's, what's it going to do? Yeah. Matt. Yeah, um, this is in our wastewater division. It's our field crew truck, um, the truck that goes out, uh, check manholes, check um, lift stations on a daily basis. So it's a uh, just our basic utility truck that's got equipment to do minor repairs um, and also to uh, do any of the uh, um, the inspection type process that we do on a daily basis. Second. Um, so is this truck, because I know that we got all kinds of different trucks and not every truck is used every day. So what's the frequency of use of this truck. This Do you have a, an idea? Yeah, um, this truck will get used probably um, at least four days a week, if not five days a week. Um, it's also used on the weekends to do rounds. Um, the the field crew, um, there are four gentlemen that that basically run that that division that are in charge of all the lift stations. Um, so it's, it's basically their their one of their main trucks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional questions? No. <clears throat> so roll call. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Sorrentino? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? No. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman Messina? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. It passes. Recommendation for approval of the program for the selling uh, selling of street sign and stop sign from the sign changeover project. That is my motion. Second. Alderman Woods. Yeah, on the sale, uh, my one thought process was be to auction these off at the uh, Wooddale Gala, and we could actually double the price. I mean, there's minimal number of street signs on, on a lot of the streets, so I would envision that there'd be more than one person interested in, let's say, two different signs if there's 40 people on the block. So I think giving them, uh, everybody, the ability to purchase the sign. Otherwise, how would you do it? The first guy at the window? Mr. York. Yeah, um, let me just kind of give you a little bit of background of how, of how this kind of came about. Uh, when we took the signs down um, in Bensonville, it was done in a similar manner um, that what they did was, um, People could call in. It was first come, first serve. It became a logistical nightmare to make sure that, you know, the person called at 707 and talked to one person, and one person called at 708 and talked to another person, and the 708 person went and grabbed the sign before the 707 person did, and it was a mess. So our thought was the easiest way to do this would be in person, one-on-one, -on -one, and we could do it at Prairie Fest on Thursday night. Um, which is the resident appreciation night and um, also on Sunday because it's a little slower on Thursday night it's a little slower especially on Sunday afternoon um, that we could sell them on a first come first serve basis um, the street name signs and the stop signs that we have um, in uh, in stock right now um, it would alleviate um, having to set up a website control that monitor it um, making sure that we got it, got the person to come in and pay for it, get it to the person. Um, doing things like at the gala, um, there are a large number of signs. There are about 338 regular name signs. Um, to take some of those signs and do them at the gala, it's a, it's a good idea. Um, to, uh, to do them all that way, probably not a great idea. Um, but, and then also you're, now you're limiting the people that can actually 
do the, is to the people that pay to go to the gala as well. So um, I'm up to whatever you guys want to do. I mean, we'll, we'll make it work. Um, we just thought that uh, selling them at Prairie Fest would be um, um, one way that we could uh, to get hopefully get rid of a lot of them quickly and also have people come up um, to Prairie Fest and enjoy the time up there as well. I want to see if I'm doing follow up or no? I, I, I did, but there were a lot of, but well, I'll, I'll make it quick, so. And, and uh, the same token, I can't make it to Prairie Fest Thursday evening, so then I'm out, and then how do you handle 200 people running to the one booth to get the <coughs> sign? I think there needs to be a, another way, or maybe we take part of the signs, take them to the gala so that you offer more than one opportunity i know you don't want to set up a separate website and create you know more work to doing it but i think given especially on a lot of the streets there's only like two signs so mm -hmm. the fastest guy wins the sign or the guy that goes to the dinner maybe one goes to the prairie fest and one goes to the gala and and the gala would net you more money probably mm -hmm. double to triple the amount of money hold on messino yeah I Kind of disagree, I guess, with Oliver and Woods in that, yeah, I mean, it's an unfair advantage for someone that has the money to fork over to go to the gala. Uh, I knew this coming up, this would be an issue. I, I cannot believe how many people have asked about these signs. So, I, in my opinion, I don't think we should roll out anything until there's a clear cut plan. Um, you know, I've had, just in my block alone, I've had four people ask. I've had other people ask all over town. I mean, you see how many darn calls we get about it. I, I just hope you guys have a better plan. I mean, I know you're coming to us. Uh, yeah. I do think there's people that would want to buy them. I, we have somebody who wants to buy it for Christmas. Yeah. So, I mean, that, I mean, we have people yeah. that want to buy them now. So, to me, I only, I, as old school as it is, you either A, you have them come to the window and, and buy it and purchase it in person, or B, you prepare to do an online auction where it's le legit digital, which is a ton of work. Um, I just think we need there's a better plan. There's that'll do that for you, though. Yeah, and I just think it's a lot of work, and I don't know what the goal is of the council, but I didn't know if we were trying to make money on it, because uh, I was pretty surprised I think it was five bucks, ten, something like that. So I mean, pretty minimal. Right. Mr. Murmurs. Well, number one, I mean, obviously, I don't think we're trying to. We're not going to make huge dollars no. here. Um, Alderman Woods is correct. We'll probably get more at the charity gala. Um, the reason we're bringing it to you tonight is obviously, as Matt said, we don't have all the answers to this. Uh, we thought you guys would, would have some ideas as well. This is one of the ideas we came up with. Another one of the ideas just, you know, off the top of my head to make sure it's fair for everybody. Like you said, we only have maybe two signs of a certain street. You know, maybe put something in the newsletter. Hey, we have these city signs that are gonna be available. <coughs> if you're interested in purchasing one of the signs, fill out this form that you want Elm Street. And at Prairie Fest, as long as you've registered that you want Elm Street, we'll pull a lot out and you've got to be present to win, and you have to pay $5 or something. I don't, so everybody has a chance to sign well, up for the sign. Well, that would go to Mr. Alderman Messina's point of, then you have to purchase the gala ticket, right? No, no, what I'm saying is you, everybody would have a chance to sign up for the sign, okay. say, I want Elm Street, say 100 people sign up. Well, as long as you sign up, we'll pull a name out of the hat, and then you can purchase <laughs> Elm Street. Do you think that's good? About this side of the problem. I want to see how long Peter can keep his arm up, I see. The follow-up? I'm just worried that if we wait that long, the novelty, like we used the word again, novelty, I don't know, it's just going to wear off. By the time Prairie Fest hits, I don't, I don't think people are going to care as much as like right now, it seems like people actually. Stewart? Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not. 100% solid, gold solid, plated. Not the best idea that we could come up with, but it was a a very low um, effort part on our side to um, because if I'm going to have somebody, you know, taking phone calls or filling out these slips or doing whatever or working with a digital media person that will set up an auction site for us, um, that's all takes time and takes money. And this is very low cost. Yeah, the novelty may wear off, but there's, I mean, we don't really have another time to do it. I mean, that another big city function. I mean, we, I mean, if you look in here, um, we said at tree lighting, you know, if we could have had them all done this year before yeah. tree lighting, maybe we would have done something there, but 
obviously that wasn't an option. So, um, I mean, it's not, like I said, it's, it's $5,000. I mean, yeah. maybe you could make $10,000 if you jack up the price, but I mean, I don't know how much um, a street name sign would be worth. I don't, I don't know what some, somebody may spend $100 on it and some per, somebody might laugh at you for $5, so. Well, before Alderman Jigga blows a rotator cup, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I'm kind of a, you know, a couple things. Number one, um, waiting for Prairie Fest, uh, the novelty is going to wear off. I mean, I don't see why we couldn't advertise it. And if people want one, when they come to the, to the finance department to pay their bills, they could buy it at the finance department. If they're available, they're available. I, to be honest with you, I don't see 100 people standing in line in the finance to get a street sign I just don't see it yeah. and second of all we constantly complain about storage all of a sudden we have all kind of storage for thousands of signs 384 well, Mr. York. yes I mean I've got four, there are four skits mm -hmm. there's four skits of signs to bring them over and put them in the finance department I'm gonna guess mr. Wilson does not have room for four skids worth of signs in his department to so it's this is a very simple project, but it's very logistically enriched by us being in different locations. Um, to sell them, yeah, it's easy to sell them, but it's going to be very hard for us to manage it. And that's why we brought forward this plan. I mean, I don't, some of you don't think we thought about this, but we actually did. This would be a very, um, logistically simple plan for us to do it. And now I understand the whole novelty and wearing off, I understand that, but we'll give them all to Alderman Woods and he can sell them all at the gala. And then we'll, then if that's what you guys want to do, then that's fine as well. Alderman Wesley. Here's my suggestion. That's okay, he can well, go it. Uh, here's my suggestion. I'm say, uh, Roy, I'm sorry. I, I agree. Prairie Fest is up. Why can we not? We know these people have to come in and buy their vehicle stickers. Okay. So why could we not? Why could we not, if you, people want to buy their vehicle sticker, take their name down. When they come in, buy their vehicle sticker. If they want that sign, if someone already came in, bought their vehicle sticker, and bought the sign, then it's gone already. It will be easier to do that. First of all, you're talking man hours of, of someone manning some, some booth out there for, at Prairie Fest, okay? Who's going to do that, okay? So my suggestion is just make a master list of all the signs. If Joe Smoke comes in and buys a vehicle sticker and he wants to buy that sign, put it in the newsletter or on the water bill that the signs are gonna be for sale when you come and pick up your vehicle sticker. First come, first serve basis instead of doing what we're doing. I mean, it's a waste. To me, it's a more of a time having them at Prairie Fest. You know, then that, that might indicate that more people may come in, buy their vehicle stickers. So that's my opinion. I'm sure you already have them well inventoried, correct? Yeah. Yes. Mr. Murmurs. Just, Murmurs, just from a staffing perspective, I know that vehicle sticker season is very chaotic and hectic down in the finance department. And to, and to add that layer, is asking for trouble because you already have feisty people in here mad about coming in vehicle stickers there's a lot of people in line we have to hire extra staff and to throw the signs in I don't know if that's the best idea where was it mr. York are you telling me we don't have a an account with gov dos or public surplus or one of those accounts and I'll let you answer that. I got to follow up. Sure. Yes, we do have a uh, uh, gov um, gov deal. Um, public surplus, so publicsurplus.com. We utilize for our vehicles. So um, the reason why I say this is because at the Forest Preserve we got just a chair, just a regular chair like that could go for five dollars, and it's on that site. 
So, I mean, I don't think everyone in Wooddale is going to buy a sign, and I don't think we're going to sell all these signs to all the residents. So, some people can't make it to Prairie Fest, some people can't make it to Gala, some people can't make it to tree lighting. I like the idea of just putting it up for auction and yeah. deal with it that way on the site. That's fine. You just take the sheet, Sorry, and take a copy of one, and just put the sheet there and bid it from there. All of Sorrentino. Uh, all of this starts, you mentioned something earlier about how many signs there were? 700. 711. All right, now I'm looking at this uh, chamber situation. There are six nonprofits that are going to be getting a nice check from us as they do each year. Why can't we divide those six, 700 signs to these six or however many charities we have and throw them all, let them sell it, and uh, get them all finished? It's not going over too big, is it? <laughs> I can feel it. It's not going over too big. No. Okay, so I think the uh, the raffling raffling in the off is more fair, um, and I do like the idea at Perry Fest. You're going to get more residents out there, and of course we're going to market it, letting the residents know that we're uh, raffling off the signs, and that's probably done more fairly. Um, you know, as far as staffing, we can have volunteers to staff at um, the booth, but. Um, I think that would be the best way to do it fairly. If you start putting them up for sale and, and first come, first serve, we're going to have complaints. I, I mean, I've got a lot of residents that are interested in buying. So what do you do when you have four or five people in your street that want to buy the signs? You can, you can have issues. So doing it, raffling it off, that's the best way to do it. So I want to make a motion. I like that. Uh, the Perry Fest and the novelty is not going to wear out. Alderman Messina. That's my motion. No second. So I hear some resounding themes here. I hear man hours. You guys don't have the man hours. I hear fairness. And then I hear special events. So oddly enough, I actually agree with Alderman uh, Roy Wesley's idea to actually bring this online do it to a dot govern auction because that eliminates any any of us any staff anybody being put in an awkward position to try to push these things and at the same time if there's overages that we can't push by the gala or by prairie fest then we can do that and you talk about the man hours and where are we going to put 700 signs well now you have it all online so knock your socks off you want to buy it at the gala all you need is one of these bad boys. You don't need anything else. And then we can do it where they can pick it up once a month or once every three weeks from City Hall. And that's, to me, the least amount. It addresses the most concerns. The man hours, the fairness. We're not trying to make money. And I don't think one person has said we're trying to make money. So if we, if we outsource it to these guys, let them deal with it. It's the fairest way. And then any overage, we can do with these special events that you guys are talking about. So that's my motion. Second. A question, Mr. Williams. I think, Brad, do you, do you want to comment on the public surplus site thing and how it works and the timing of it and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, we can, if, for public surplus, I mean, it's 7.5% it's um, over what the cost of the, um, so if it's a $5, so then they pay 35, 40 extra cents to because that's how they make their money um, and then um, how it would normally work is um, can they pay on I think they could pay online yeah here comes Brad thank you mr. chairman yeah, so um, to, to back up a little bit, to start the whole auction thing, somebody um, currently, when we sell things on the public surplus site, somebody typically, uh, somebody in the garage, mm -hmm. has to take photographs and get a description of the item and then place it on the website. 
So yeah, for every sign. Yes. Yes, for every sign, for every yes. for every item we would have to place. So however many different unique signs there are, we would have to put up a listing for each sign. So 700 and some odd signs, we'd have 700 and some odd items on the public surplus site. So that that's a. Um, but then they can pay, really in person at City Hall, cash, credit, or check, just like you would pay any other bill. And that uh, the surplus, yes, we do pass that on, or the surcharge, we do pass that on to the purchaser, um, which then we remit to uh, the public group as their collection fee. Mr. Wilson, is that a requirement that you have to do that? That whole step with the putting them all on each individual, individual one? Meeting. Well, yeah, I mean, the way that it would work is if you wanted the Roy street name sign, you would vote on, you would bid on the Roy sign. And everybody that else that wants that Roy sign is bidding on that one sign. So if there's multiple Roy's, then there would be multiple listings, but um, where there could be two quantity of, well, <coughs> mul right you'd multiple, multiple listings on that one probably. Um, like Potter, there's, we have 18 Potter signs, so there'd be 18 different listings for Potter, and you can bid on that one. Otherwise, if you just say, here's a list of all of them, right, vote, then it doesn't work that way. Alderman Jacobs and waiting. Uh, again, going back to I've heard time, comments about the staffing, I, I don't see how, why it would be so difficult for someone to come into the finance department and say, I'd like this sign if they're first in line, you have to go to public works at such and such a time on a day, Monday through Tuesday, Wednesday, or whatever it is, from 2 to 4 o'clock and have somebody there give them the sign and Brad collects the money in finance. And the storage is already at Public Works. I, I don't see why, why is that so difficult. We already have people working the window at <coughs> Finance. You have staff available at Public Works. So I'm not really sure why this would be so difficult. Sounds like, okay, so now we're saying that we agree we don't try to make money and we agree we don't want to put the burden on them because these signs are a pain in the neck. So if I go back to Alderman Sorrentino's request, is there is there a spot since we don't want to put it on finances plate, where maybe we can say if you want your nonprofit to give your nonprofit an opportunity to make some money, you can send someone to staff our window and you can keep those proceeds, a portion of those proceeds. We're only talking three thousand five hundred bucks here, so. All right. I mean, when it comes down to it, it's not. We're not talking that much money. Huh? Mayor, I'll give you a chance, Berkeley. Thank you. If we just promote it in the next newsletter, not, not the one that's coming out basically next week, but for March, April, can we use the, our website already where we can submit payment? Not payment, but. <laughs> If you have an issue on your street, you can put in a, you know, I got an issue at uh, Parliament uh, Irving and Whitdale Road. Yeah. I, can we just, somebody goes in, I'd like to buy a sign. Boom, come and pick it up. You're the first one on the web. But we advertise it, we put it out there on the 15th, starting at, you know, 6 a.m., whatever. Yes, um, I believe that can work. Um, the whole thing is now someone's going to get an email. Someone's got to take that email, compare it to the list of signs that are available, um, but, but respond to the email to say that this that the sign is available and that they need to come in during these times to pick them up, get that sign, take it over to finance with a tag on it to say who's who sign it is, so they don't have to then go over to Public Works and pick it up. Um, also, a little, a little dramatic with the amount of work. <laughs> I'm just telling you the steps. Right. It's, it's really not. Scary. It's not like snapping a finger no, no, and no. getting this done. Wait, wait. There, Matt. Basically, I'm saying they come to Public Works. It's right there. We tell them where to go. They get the response. Right here. I, I don't know. Do you want us to collect money at Public Works? No, we don't collect money at Public Works. No. Nope. Well, 
Not enough mics. Dollars. This is going to be the last one I'm going to get out of hand. Well, one at a time. Clearly a timestamp. There's going to be ones that go right away, right? And there's ones that we can't get rid of for the life of me that we probably can't even give away. And we can give it away at the gala or Prairie Fest. I'm saying, to the mayor's point, I guess, we'll try a third option angle at this, to get with the We Govern app is an opportunity where it is timestamped. When it comes in, it's timestamped. You guys see it, right? You're not gonna have to, you don't have to sit there every, oh, oh, he wants it, let me respond back. You win, you're a bidder. This is not eBay, we're saying one day a week for an hour, someone sits down, I'm sure you're not, there's only 14,000 people in this town. I highly doubt you're gonna get bombarded with 55 emails. Maybe, maybe, maybe the first week, but I highly doubt that's gonna be something long-term. But at least this is timestamped. One day a week, you bring him the Brad, so what? He works till nine o'clock now. Maybe he works till ten. No, no. But I'm saying it's, we're not asking a big request. This is not the city of Chicago. I mean, there's. It's, it's, we're making making it harder than it should be. I'm, I'm gonna make one last suggestion. That I think we should just we should just bring him to the prayer fest. Zip time to the fence. Anybody who wants one, come, come take it. Just come take it. If you're there and you're there, you got it. If there's none left, there's none left. You got to be there to get it. Just like you got to be present to win a prize sometimes. Just hang them all on the fence. Have one one person there, no money, and just take it. Eat all this is a big deal. This is a this is the biggest deal I've ever seen in town over a forty year old street sign. I, I really don't care how many. I mean, there's there's only so many signs. So if you want it, come get it. But it has and, to be. And I'm not going to tie up staff. It has to be fair, but I'm not going to tie up staff, and I'm not going to tie up all this money when it, you're only. By the end of the day, thirty-five hundred dollars is now seven thousand dollars in staff time and and putting stuff online and moving it here and moving it there. There's so many moving parts. Just get rid of them. How about we just dump them in the garbage? Uh-oh. Nick's got something. Uh -oh. Nick. Sorry. Go ahead. We govern app will not work, but we can use a forms builder on the website. Collect forms that people could fill out, explaining. Uh, what's you know they can put in for whatever sign they want that will be time stamped we can give them a month to figure it out at the end of the month we can collect the forms sort through the list then everybody's got another week or month to pay then they pick them up on whatever day they want just a suggestion who's we but that's what I said we who, being whoever bid on it that's what yeah that's what the mayor oh, said originally I think yes. I'm the staff well, the forms, the, we, we, we would just collect again. forms until one, up until, let's say, a month's end or however long you guys would want to set it up for. And then it's a one-time thing. We go through it, we're done. Right. But that's what I said. We put in the next newsletter, very one simple. Yeah. On this date, <clears throat> starting at 6 a.m., you go in, you make the request. It's time-stamped. If it's, it's, if it's stamped at 5.59, I'm sorry, you lost at six o'clock, you're in, and and basically, and just say that. And once a week, we're going to look at these, we and we will respond to these. I don't know what's what's the big deal. I don't even know if I can say this with a straight face, but what if somebody works the third shift and they have no access to the internet? It wasn't fair to them. Uh, there's a motion and a second on the floor. Mm -hmm. To go to the internet, right? Yeah. Yeah, but, but on his motion, Mick just said that well, our motion was the gov 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 public service. No, using no. it on a third party. He was party. saying using the We Govern app. We Govern app, the city one. Oh, using the city yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. My motion is to outsource it, just to let somebody else deal with it, and then any spillover we don't sell via that. We can sell it to special events, the gala, the uh, whatever, the yeah. Prairie Fest, and then the tree lighting. But at least this allows the ones that we know are going to move fast, this allows a fair mechanism, because the people that are going to complain are probably the ones that truly are dying to get it. The ones we sell at Prairie Fest, they're just going to get it because it's five bucks and they just want to get it because it looks cool for their group. So who made the motion? It was myself, and then Roy seconded it. Which? Alderman Roy Wesley. Which? Yes. Uh, 
What sites do we have? Just public surplus or GovDO2? We don't even know what the outsource fee would be, so. Public surplus is 7.5%. What is GovDO? Out of three thirty five hundred dollars So instead of $5, it's seven, <coughs> seven, five dollars and thirty five dollars and seven cents. Yeah, so 70 cents, right? 70 well, cents. depends on if you pass the charge on to the resident or not. Which we do. Which we do. I think for $5, it's a steal of a deal. I think they're okay. Do we not? <laughs> Mike. There's a motion on the floor in a second. Uh, wait, can I can I make it? Since I have the ones? No? Okay. I'm done. We can push which, it out. Which site? A motion and a second. No Roll call, please. <clears throat> What's the motion? Can we get the motion? Okay. Go on the website. Go to the so website. the motion would be to outsource. It's not that wasn't it, the motion. It's not yes. outsource. Okay. Okay, the dot .gov, whoever those people are. She's going to um, she's gonna go that back because your original motion was not to outsource. It was to put it on. Put it online. Yeah, an online right? auction. Yeah, the dot .gov. Okay, so my motion is to put it to an online auction where the city wouldn't have to bear the burden uh, of that, understanding that the, there would be, the fee would be assessed on top of the selling price, uh, but allowing the city to promote it via the newsletter, our Facebook page, et cetera, et cetera. Any of those signs not sold through the online auction can then be sold through these city special events, which include the gala, the Prairie Fest, the tree lighting, and that is my motion. I do have a question. Amen. Okay. I got it. There. So this is the one where you guys got to go and, and photograph every sign, right? Yes. One time. What a waste. Uh, for the thirty-five hundred dollars, we got it. If we sell them all, right? It's almost to the point of scrap. Would for some of them. You mean, What's aluminum going for? I'll take the pictures. You need me to take seven hundred pictures. It takes approximately one second to take. I could. That's the word you worried about, and that's fine. It's the, the easy seconder part. agree. Yep. Roll call. I think we're, that's the, Alderman Roy Wesley. Yes. Alderman Sorrentino. Um, no, sorry. Alderman Jacob. Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley. Yes. <laughs> okay. Catalano. No. Alderman Sismarski. No. Alderman Messina. Yes. Alderman Woods. No. I did. I'd like to make a motion to do it at the Perry Fest and do a lottery or a raffle. That's the only way it's going to be done fair. That's my motion. Sorry. Alderman Messina. Is your motion going to open it up to anything sooner than Perry Fest? Sooner than Perifest? No, Perifest. Just Perifest. Yeah. I have a... Alderman Wesley, Roy Wesley. I take it whatever funds we get from this is going to go back in general fund. Correct? It's to go to pay for the signs we just put up. Pardon me? <laughs> well, it, could, it could go we go back to the signs we just put up. Partial pay. I mean, it's... 35, it should, because it's $3,500. It could go back to the taxpayers' signs. It's the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Do you want to make so, a... Amend the, amend the motion to send them more profit process proceeds to the yes yes second or agree yes roll call alderman roy wesley yes alderman sorrentino yes alderman jacob no alderman eugene wesley <laughs> alderman catalano yes alderman sismarski yes alderman messina just to make this fun no Alderman Woods. No. Did that pass? No. Four, three, did that pass? Four, three, and one. one uh, Eugene? Did you did? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let's, let's keep going. All right. Yeah. It passes. <laughs> Just so people know out there, after all this confusion, they will be at Prairie Fest. <laughs> I 
highest bidder. To the highest bidder. Next, I have uh, approval. No, uh, no, 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 that's not true. It's not to the highest bidder. I We're going to raffle them the off and, and give them away. Okay. okay. I was feeding them no, stuff. It was, just, there clarify, we're raffling them off and giving them away, or raffling for the right to buy them for $5? <laughs> right, yeah. Right. Raffling for the right to buy them five, for $5. I thought it was five bucks. Whoever, you got five bucks in your hand, you're the first one there, you yeah. get it. We'll buy them all tonight. And whatever's left, we'll figure that out when we're done with the Prairie Fest. Figure it out. Okay. And that money goes to this, this, the new signs. All right, that's it. We got any other street signs we need? Approval contracts of Superior Ground Services Incorporated with brush collection program that not to include a not to exceed amount of one hundred forty-two thousand five hundred dollars and zero cents is my motion. Second. Questions? Roy Wesley. Mr. York. Well, I guess the first question would be to the attorney since he's here. I was looking through their proposal here and on their corporation it says president secretary and treasurer all at the same person i've never seen that before <laughs> well closely held corporation for what yeah, that's for the what? first question i have for sister city <laughs> no. Mr. Bond. Yeah, they, they generally for a smaller corporation, that would be, uh, they are required to have two officers, somebody to the president or somebody to sign on behalf of, and then somebody to attest to that signature. So as long as they comply with that, that's sufficient for the state of Illinois under the uh, Business Corporation Act. I believe that this bid in front of us had president, secretary, treasurer, all the same person. That's the first thing. So does that, and associates, that for plant. Yeah, that I'd, I'd have to look and see. There, there's somebody who's registered with the Secretary of State. If they're a corporation, they have to have uh, identified two corporate officers with the state of Illinois. But they signed a signed document here for that, that they listed all three. Right, but the state of Illinois wouldn't allow them to incorporate unless they had actually provided two of those two officers for that purpose. Okay, that's so, the first question. Uh, Mr. York? Yes. Has this company ever done uh, any municipalities before? Mr. York? Um, as far as we know, they have not done any municipal work before in speaking with them. And Mr. Bond, do we have to take this company? Mr. Bond? Well, the, uh, this went out to bid. There's uh, some provisions where you, things that have to be bid and some that don't. Uh, but you are, if you uh, put an item out to bid, uh, you are required under the state statute uh, to select the lowest responsible bidder. Uh, and that uh, is defined by the courts as something that is within the sound, reasonable discretion of the city uh, without unfair dealing or favoritism. It's governed by certain factors, including the bidder's credentials, the financial stability and health of the bidder, the bonding capacity of the bidder, whatever insurance protections are required, qualifications of management and labor, past experience and ability to complete a project, and outstanding, if they have any outstanding liabilities, judgments, lawsuits, and liens. So those are all factors you can determine. So in other words, they, the lowest price in and of itself is not the determining factor. You can consider these other things. Okay, uh, one more question to Mr. York. Have we had any problems with MDL before, and how many years have they been doing it for the city of Woodale? Mr. York. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we have not had any problems with MDL since I've been employed with the city and to since 2013. Um, I do not know for sure how many years they've been doing the brush collection. I know they were doing it prior to me starting here and have done since um, my employment. So I would say at least five, if not seven or eight years. I do have <clears throat> one more thing on this. In, in the contract it says if there's an emergency to come out, they would have to be here within two hours? Mr. York? 
Um, I don't know exactly where that is at um, in the contract. Um, I did speak um, with Mr. Till today um, at, after you asked me that question, and he said that um, he would be here um, full of people on stock or on, on the boots on the ground within between two and three hours. Um, but just so everybody is aware, um, the last storm that we had and I, um, the microburst that came through Itasca this past um, summer, um, we did not utilize a brush collection service um, on an emergency needs basis. We, uh, we did do an emergency brush pickup, but that was uh, a number of days after the fact. And one more thing. I just want to keep in mind that I don't think Mr. York was here when the Michael Burst came through Oak Meadows and came through Ward 1. The MDL was out there pretty quick when they did. That was a lot bigger one um, that we had to deal with at that time. <clears throat> and they were there pretty quick. So I'd like to keep that in mind. And we're talking a difference of $2,500 on this contract. We do have Matt in reserve, or MDL in reserve, correct? Didn't they? You won't. MDL? I thought, I thought we didn't use them at that he didn't want a contract. MDL is our current brush collection. I company. thought he was just emergency brush no. collection. No, who, just to, <clears throat> just so people, everybody understand what we're talking about. Because in the contract for the garbage, what is the brush collection for that? The, what they were covering. The uh, garbage company reimburses us for the cost of this brush collection contract. So this brush collection contract of one hundred forty-two thousand dollars. <clears throat> excuse me, will not be um, expended. It'll be expended by the city, but it'll be reimbursed through we the bar to, garbage company. Right, we have to grant the contract and they'll recut us a check for it. Yes. It's considered a pass-through cost right. uh, for, in, in accordance with our it waste hauler contract. It has to be voted on. Mr. Jacob, you've been your next. Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> Mr. York, I, I actually have some of the same concerns. I mean, this company, it looks to me like it's a landscaping company. <laughs> they have no municipal references whatsoever. I mean, I'd have to say that any time <clears throat> I've ever had a resident talk about trees on their own property, everybody seems to know MDL. I, I mean, we're going to hire a company. We. I mean, they don't even have any municipal references, so I don't see how that could qualify for this. I, I just don't get it. <clears throat> yes, um, we did check their references. Their references did come back that they were um, a, a good, viable company. Um, both Mr. Rubach and myself have both talked to Mr. Till uh, regarding this contract. Um, he is eager to, uh, to get into this um, realm, uh, municipal realm. Um, he understands the the um, the requirements of this project. Um, he <laughs> understands um, the needs that we have, um, like if uh, a location is missed or a resident brings out their stuff too late, he's required to go back and pick them up. Um, he agreed to all of those provisions. Um, he. Uh, has the equipment or has stated to us that he has the equipment and the manpower to be able to do this type of project. Um, so that is why we brought him forward as a responsible bidder um, and um, that meets the statutory requirements. Follow up, Mr. Jacob. Yes, uh, final question would be what if he cannot deliver on all of these? Do we have some outs there? Is your final answer? Mr. York? Yes, there is a clause in the contract. Um, there's a performance bond of 25% of the cost of the project, <coughs> which is basically one full year's worth of, of work um, that we can go after. Um, after. He has a whole week to complete the project um, on every, every time. So if, if the project starts on a Monday, he has until um, the end of the day on Friday to complete the, um, the work within town. If that work is not completed within those five uh, business days, um, there's a $500 per day liquidated damages um, for him to complete the work. Um, 
And then um, if the work is not completed um, after probably consultation with legal, um, if it hasn't been completed in say four, five, six, seven days after that week, um, he will be in breach of his contract and um, we can um, um, dissolve the contract um, and pull the uh, and work to pull the performance bond to uh, to pay for additional costs um, that would be to bring in another company to complete the work that has been done not been done. Alderman well, Messina, so, uh, he had a couple questions, probably legal questions, but d do we have the authority? So clearly, we don't have a municipal reference. Do we have the ability to have staff go there and actually yeah. visually either a look at his books to make sure he's got headcount? To justify this because this is a delivery service that is a reflection back on us and more importantly you guys whether we like it or not so do we have authority to actually look at his books to see if revenue wise headcount allocation wise this guy could even perform that is my first question mr. bond yeah the the uh, courts have said that uh, financial stability and health is one of the one of the factors you can utilize so in order to determine their their financial stability that uh, you would you would have, be able to do that the company of course could refuse which might suggest something we'll follow up. yeah so I guess I would ask the public works director directly did you take a look at his books could you share with us his headcount currently <coughs> no I have not taken a look at his finances and I'm not um, I do not have a headcount for him so um, to be honest, would you with say he's financially responsible if you've not looked at his books, you don't know his headcount, but yet you're going to put us all on the hook to do deliver a service that we don't even know if the guy can do or he's going to outsource it. I'd well, to be honest with you, I mean, if you knew that you were going to get a project like this, would you hire the people ahead of time to be, um, if, to, if you were going to gain a new project, would you hire them ahead of time before receiving the contract? Or would you wait until the con you were received the contract to hire more people and to get and if you needed more equipment? I would probably, as a business owner, would say I would probably wait until I at least got the contract document that it was approved um, before I would go out and hire more people to do this work. So, um, and, and the, so in the, in the theme of Alderman Sorrentino's comment earlier about us being a kind of cut above the rest, uh, this is a prime example where I don't know if I want to be the guinea pig for this individual. Um, you know, uh, to us, one thing that stands out about Wooddale is we deliver exceptional, not good service, exceptional. Whether it's PD, public works, et cetera. And if I'm going to outsource something, that to me is too big of a risk. So I I'm not in favor of moving forward with this or bring it up for a rebid or my other question was to the city attorney is since this is a pull through from flood brothers can they can they actually go out and, and rebid this entire thing or do something different no mr mr brown yeah no it, it's we have a contract with uh with flood brothers and we are the ones responsible for securing because you wanted to retain that if you remember that was part of the the right. call so the flood brothers didn't get or whoever our waste hauler is didn't get whoever they wanted we got somebody that was of the choosing of the of council to have the same analysis you're doing now with the with the bids that are before you to okay. be able to do that so that's not part of the waste hauler contract it was re retained to the city council to make that determination in the city thank you mr woods uh, one as far as the qualification thing so they they have to have a bond you're saying for one year so one year's worth so yes. the bond company is looking into them and deeming that they're a viable company to take on this contract for one which would be the same as the other and secondly I I understand the argument for a minimal cost or a minimal difference you have a known entity and an unknown entity but the flip side to that is uh, one day not too long ago MDL was an unknown entity uh, actually one of our board members years ago was an unknown entity and he got a tree trimming contract too so uh, everybody's got to start somewhere and if they've been around and the insurance company uh, is willing to bond them they don't do that without knowing the company I mean uh, I, so I, I, I think as far as them being viable I, I, I think we can agree that the, you know as much as you can judge something up front that they would be a viable option now if everybody wants to default to the 
the known entity, I, I, I get it, but everybody's got to start somewhere. I wouldn't pick on the, the company just because they're new to the arena. What's the question, Mr. Wesley? Here, here's the two items that I, I'm considered about this contract. One, if, if that is legit, that three people are listed on that contract, all those three names, Farm Concern, they didn't do the proper bid process. We have thrown people through bids out before that wasn't filing the paperwork right. So if there's three names of the same person, you're telling me that they can't have the three names or, or they could have no, they all three names. Mr. Barnes. No, in our contract, the, the bid documents. But they the can. bid, bid the state, document. Yeah, but no, they can. That, that's not, that doesn't violate the bid specs. What I said was in order for them to be incorporated, this, the Secretary of State's office requires there to be two officers, registered officers with them. It can be, they can have another individual. That person can serve in all three of those capacities. And again, that's not, our bid documents don't mirror the requirements of the Secretary of State. That doesn't disqualify them from being eligible to bid. Okay. Then if, the other <laughs> question I had here is, Matt, you made a statement that they got one week to pick up the brush throughout our town. Okay, let me just tell you one thing. For $2,000, okay, difference in this contract, MDL is out of here sometimes within a day, maybe two days in a whole entire city. Okay, so what I'm, so they got out here in two days, now we're giving these guys seven days to pick up all the brush. My, my concern about the whole thing is, is, is that the length of the time to pick up the brush? That, that's, that's my concern. For $2,000, yes, the $2,000 different, I rather leave with MDL. And I know you're going to say me whatever you want, but I can't. The bid document allows them five days. It allowed MDL five days this year. It allowed whatever company that would have won this bid five days. Does that mean that Superior will take five days to do this? I don't know. Because they've never done it for us before. So, so they have five days. If it takes them two days, then it takes them two days. If it takes them five days, it takes them five days. So let, let me do a follow-up on that. So my question is, so after day six, or, or whatever, day six, if the brush is not picked up in this town, to the whole town within day six, what are we going to do? Do the legal thing or call Pat Bond and say, hey, by the way, they didn't finish, and we delay the br brush pickup for the rest of it? How are we going to handle that when a resident calls saying that the brush pickup has sat there for two days? Are we then going back out there and pick it up ourselves? <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I understand the legal perspective. Pat, you're telling me that seven days. You're going to tell me, well, we got to send them a letter with the attorney's approval, and we'll let the process go. It could sit out there a week until it gets picked up. Mr. Come York, on. But In the document of the contract, it says they have five business days to complete the task. After five business days, it's a $500 liquidated damages per day after that until the work is completed. It says in the contract it's $500 per day. So once they are at four days, we will contact them and say, you've got one more day to do it. We shouldn't contact them. They're in all the contract, five days. We shouldn't give them a restraint. Oh, let me just tell you, if you ain't picked up in another day, we're going to have a $500 liquidated damage. That ain't how the contracts work. He signed the contract, five days we shouldn't warn him. There. No, no, no. All right. Yeah. MDL did a nice job, okay, I understand. Before then we had somebody else, I forget their name, they did a nice job. And I can tell you, I've seen after the previous guys, these guys, and I'm sure it's gonna happen with, if we go with these guys, Supposed to have your stuff out there Monday morning, come Thursday night or Friday the next that week. I've seen it. Come Saturday, there's brush on the on the curb again. How did we handle it then? 
I'm sure we're going to handle it the same way, right? Because they're going to say, oh, mine didn't get picked up. And I can tell you, it wasn't there Monday, Tuesday. I drive past it every day on the way to work. Come Saturday, it's there. Oh, miraculously. Mm -hmm. They missed it. They didn't miss it. But we've had these issues before. I don't know what, Matt, if you want to touch on how we handled it. Whatever. Yeah, for the most part, we would contact MDL or whoever the contractor was and have them come back and do it. If it's, um, if it's a long period of time afterwards and, you know, and it's a, it is a hazard, um, then sometimes the city would go out, we would go out ourselves and pick it up. Um, if it was like a sight line hazard or, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, everybody's going to push the envelope as much as they can. I didn't get myself out on Monday. I got myself out on Wednesday. Um, it happens. We uh, try to work with all contractors on making sure that we know what they've done, when they've done it, so that uh, when they people call in and say, just like with their garbage, hey, it's, it's Wednesday, nobody came and picked up my garbage, or it's Tuesday, nobody came and picked up my garbage. Well, you, did you get it out there at 7 o'clock in the morning? Well, no, I just took it out. Okay, well, we'll call them and see if they can come pick them up. So. <clears throat> Last question. No, I have Another one? I follow. Oh, I have follow. <laughs> There's Good. times also that people put it out, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have gotten these calls. They, they'll put it out two weeks after the pickup and say, is anybody going to pick this up? And mm -hmm. my response is, well, we had brush pickup two weeks ago. Yeah, but Mayor, I didn't get a chance. So, mm -hmm. you know, I felt like doing it this weekend. So can't you just come and get it for me? Mm -hmm. I'm sure we've all gotten those calls, right? No. And, and sits. That's only really? one. I haven't gotten. Really? You haven't gotten? I haven't gotten quite I'm a few. Just kidding. And it sits until the next brush pickup. I mean, we told them. Last question, Mr. Messina. Question and then a motion. Uh, my question is, if we decide to reject the bids today and let the contract lapse, no legally, lapse. can we just continue as is? And if so, how long? You could reject all bids. Mr. Bond? Well, you, you can reject all bids. You can select uh, any of the other bidders. You can, if you reject all bids, obviously you need to have the brush uh, pick up. You would have to give uh, direction or authorization to remain, uh, continue to have the brush pick up by the current uh, company so that there's no break in services, if that were the case. And then the terms would have to yep. be, to, you know, agreed upon. And I'd like to make a motion to allow the current contract or excuse me, I'd like to make a motion to deny okay. mm -hmm. or reject this bidding oh, yeah. Yeah. and uh, continue our service as is with our current provider. I believe there's already a motion. Yeah, just yeah. procedurally there was a motion to approve the contract to yeah. superior ground services for brush oh, collection so you've got to either yeah. you second. address yeah. that motion or Okay. Do you want to suppress your motion or no? So there's a motion on the floor. It simply needs to be addressed or withdrawn <clears throat> before a, uh, another motion could or be entertained. The first motion is out there. Approval of contract for ground service. That would be that would be the chairman. It would be me and the seconder. Second was uh, Alderman Woods. So the motion. Yeah, yeah we'll just, we'll just get, yeah, get that out of the way. Yeah. So, okay, Alderman. So, so it's for, it's for the, original, the motion is to approve motion. the contract the paper, with right Superior Ground Services. Yeah. Alderman Catalano. Yes. Alderman Sosmarski. Yes. Alderman Messina. I just want to be clear. This is for this company, this new proposal. Okay, no. Oh my gosh. Alderman Woods. Now he's got a motion. No. Alderman Eugene Wesley. No. Alderman Jacob. No. Alderman Sorrentino. Well, I believe in giving everybody a fair shot, so I'm going to say yes to see what they're all about. Alderman Rory Wesley. No. Fail. Fail. All right. 
I'd like to move forward with making a motion now that the existing motion has failed to continue services uh, with our current provider, MDL. That's my motion. Second. Second. Mr. Bond. I'll yeah, give it to Peter. If that's the uh, case, perhaps the uh, uh, motion, just so there's no issues with negotiating terms. You've got they've, uh, M MDL has uh, provided a bid. They were the second lowest response, less second lowest bidder. And if you wanted to uh, go with them, you've already got a ready-made contract. You don't have to reformat the, the terms of it, so you could make a motion to approve a contract for them in, a, in the amount that they've bid. Could you remind us of that amount? Mr. York. Um, yeah. Four years. Four years. I got it. Four year. It's a four year contract. There's a motion. Yeah, like he's a, clarifying. Um, it was like $2,000, I think. One forty. One forty-four. <clears throat> I'll tell you. I left my iPad over there during the grilling. It's 144000 for the four years. Yeah, probably. Yeah. 144000 for a four-year right. contract. Yeah. Which is cheaper than... You said for four years? Yeah. It's $36,000 a year. And the other contract was also four years? Yes. Prior? All right, we got our. You can just go. Well, that's that's a motion. Well, if that's if that's acceptable, and it's it's a five hundred dollars savings per year per, per contract year per, per uh, um, pickup. Pick so it's three thousand dollars a year. Sorry. If we utilize, if we go with MDL's new bid, it's actually cheaper than extending the contract. Okay. So. Knowing that, I'd, I'd like to make a motion on the floor to approve the contract of 144000 uh, for a four-year contract with MDL. That's my motion. Second. Second. No, no. Well, I already no. seconded it. I agree. He just... Okay, I'd like to amend my motion uh, to approve the contract with MDL in the amount of 144000 over a four-year term. That is my motion. That's is the second or agree? Yes. Oh, Roll call. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman Messina? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Sorrentino? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Okay. Next is approval of rear yard drainage <clears throat> program standards, Mr. York. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so last year during the CIP, we discussed um, doing some work on private property for rear yard drainage. And um, we had budgeted $30,000, and the city council had asked us to uh, come up with some criteria, some standards. Um, so in front of you, we have the standards um, that um, we're looking at for um, utilization of this program. So um, some of the, uh, the highlights of it is um, that it obviously can only be used for Wooddale residents. Um, it's for only for overland, overland stormwater that causes direct damage to structures or flooding, home flooding. So it's not um, just I have water in my backyard. Uh, the water has to be there for 72 consecutive hours. Um, and um, it should impact multiple residents or homeowners. Um, uh, most of uh, we um, utilized a lot of what the um, village of Itasca uses for their rear yard drainage project um, um, as a basis for this one. So I guess if anybody has any questions. So I'm a little confused, 72 hours. You're talking about three days? The water's gonna be there for three days? Yes. So that doesn't make sense. Why are we doing this policy? When we get a, a homeowner, the damage is already done, and that's like 
a day. I mean, he's getting water in the basement, so he doesn't qualify for this policy. Mr. York, Mr. Bond. Yeah. Yeah, well, here's the, the reason. You, you've got to be very cautious, and we had this discussion a number of years ago with uh, sandbags. The city was very generous in uh, sandbagging the private residences, uh, and that, that program is not uh, in continuing a, any further because there's the Illinois uh, <coughs> Municipal Code has restrictions, as with all public uh, entities, as to what you can do with public funds. And public funds can only be used for a public purpose. They can't be used to advance a private purpose. So what we did is in putting together the policy, we did it in such a way to address those concerns and those flooding instances uh, that some could arguably say uh, only impacts that property owner who's yard or basement or whatever is, is flooding. So we tried to take in, into consideration the restriction under the state statute and still at, attempting to address those concerns of the residents because this is an area that is flood prone. Flood, flood prone. You've got Salt Creek uh, in the area. So that, that number is arbitrary to a certain extent only uh, in that there had to be some definitive uh, number that it would be uh, determined that that could have an impact. In other words, there could be the uh, the, the deterioration of the of the uh, uh, properties. It could go on to other properties. So it has a greater impact than on that single property owner. And so that's where we uh, had come up. And again, this is the other communities use a similar uh, type of standard. I know it's not ideal. The the Ideal situation would be to come immediately to the rescue, uh, but again, within the confines of the state statute, we tried to make it so you as a council could offer this assistance to the residents and still remain within the parameters of the law. And, Mr. York. Yeah, and it also, um, 72 hours of water in, is in the yard itself. It's not 72 hours of water in a person's house or up, or up against a structure. So say the water comes up, it goes in the person's house um, and recedes a little bit, but it's still in the person's backyard on day three because there's grade changes and low spots and those kinds of things. So um, it's just another one of the criteria. If it's uh, the water comes and goes automatically, um, maybe comes up and um, laps up against the side of um, a garage or something and the next morning when we go out there at, you know it's already receded back then that doesn't um, meet the criteria uh, we've got to we got to have enough criteria that everybody that has a little bit of water in their backyard that's pooling there for six hours we're not going to be able to solve all those problems so we have to have enough criteria to to um, be able to take the, the high priority ones. Good follow -up. Yeah, so, so we're starting, so if it starts raining, and um, so once the, the rain stops, then they count 72 hours from that point? Yes. The damage is done, the damage is done. It, I don't get it. And plus this, this area is not in the, close to Salt Creek and it's not in the floodplain. It was just, um, you know, a bad engineering the way the house was built. I mean, uh, if you, if, I mean, you, you know about the house, so mm -hmm. the, the property, surrounding property is all elevated and he's down in a, a scoop, so he's getting all the water, but I don't think this is, uh, okay, thank you. Jacob. And, and a lot of the flooding in the yards, and they start with um, <coughs> easements that don't, utility easements, so are we now saying we're gonna, if there's a problem with the utility easement and it meets all this other criteria, or is that if the flooding is caused from that utility easement where I mean, so I'm a little confused well, by the utility easements because that's where the cause of these problems occur for many a times. Um, I think each of these is going to be uh, looked at on a case by case basis um, to make a statement that uh, most of the problems come from utility easements. I'm going to say that that's probably not 100% um, accurate either. So um, a lot of it has to do with their neighbors building up their backyards so they don't have water in them. And then the guy that doesn't build up his backyard to have not have water in it all of a sudden has water in it. So um, 
we need to look at each one of these things on an individual basis. If they meet the criteria, then we go out and we do the work to try to figure out how to, um, how to have the resident. Um, this is basically um, the resident is the one that's doing the work and then we are um, just providing them with some assistance um, and also helping them get the water to the, to the storm sewer system versus um, us going on to private property like we've done in the past, um, acquire easements um, on the private property so that we can um, build the um, manhole structure and the piping sections and things like that. So this is all to going to be done by the resident and or their contractor, and then we will just reimburse them for um, a portion of the, of the cost. Follow up. Follow up to the attorney. So if the problem is caused, caused with an easement, I mean, I thought nobody's allowed to touch that easement because it's a utility easement. So my, I, I guess I'm saying that that means that we cannot, we're not going to reimburse them because we're not technically supposed to even touch that easement. Is that no. not correct? No, the, the easement, it depends on who the easement's in favor of. If we have a drainage easement or we have some easement where there's city, uh, some type of city infrastructure in that easement, we have the absolute right to go on that easement and, and, and address it. I, I agree with Mr. York. I think the, the majority of the because the easements, when there is an easement done wh for whatever reason, there's also uh, engineering done along with that. You know, they've determined the linear footage, if it's a uh, drainage or if it's uh, for fiber, you know, the, the uh, fiber optic cables and, and so forth. So those are generally done in a way so as to not to exasperate the, any kind of flooding situation. What happens, and I think the property that, that's been referenced, my, my understanding of it is exactly that, is that there's over time, the, the adjacent property owners have uh, altered the topography and the elevation of the property, which, you know, whoever's down at the lowest end is, is where the water's going to go, and, and that's where it's going to pool. And the reason for the program was to address those because that situation does impact the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens as opposed to just somebody's, one person's basement happens to be flooding. But we have the ability, if there is an issue with, with a, a particular easement, you're right, you can't go in there and disrupt it, but if there is something that needs to be addressed, if the easement's in favor of the city, we have the absolute right to do it. If it's in favor of another utility, uh, the city can work with that utility and, and address that problem. But what we've seen, those who've come, I think, with these, these concerns and these issues, uh, had to do with things either a bad developer, the developer didn't landscape it properly, the bad de the developer used some uh, inferior uh, you know fill to, to, to in the on the property, which ended up resulting in that property becoming uh, depressed or sinking lower than it, it otherwise should have been, or or lower than it was engineered to be. There's a question for legal: Would it be possible to change this 72 hours to 48? because of the way the rains have been coming lately in the last two years, it's like deluge is not just simple rain. Sure, I mean, it's 72 hours is a, is a proposed uh, number that is, is designed to give, you know, the water an opportunity to recede uh, because you do have these, you know, these downpours and then there may be a break uh, from that. It, you know, you, you're, you will determine that ultimately as to what that time frame is, but also there's a limit on how much you're going to reimburse a resident. 50% of the labor costs and material costs up to a total of you know 3,000. So it becomes a budget issue. If, if 48 hours, you know, results in a, a great number of claims, uh, then you know next year in the budget you may want to readdress that and, and adjust it, or you know, up or down depending on the amount of interest you get. But that number can be uh, can be determined. Mayor. by you as a council. Yeah, I've got a couple things. Uh, regarding the 72 hours, I know where you got the number because 72 hours is when mosquitoes start to whatever and it becomes public health and safety. Mm -hmm. As far as the easements, I mean, I can tell you the swales on my block, it's in the backyard, in the easement, utility easement, flows to the east, and a lot of residents who have put in pools, fences, bushes, they're not in the easement, but because they've altered the rest of it, water, I could tell you, backs up into my yard. After it stops raining six hours later, 10 hours later, whatever, depending how much water, it's gone, but it's soggy. And I understand. 
the question becomes, this is pretty much PVC pipe they're using, right, Matt? This, okay, so to run, I need to put in a manhole over there. So if they have storm sewer to the front of their house, they can run the PVC. What if they don't have a storm sewer in the front of their house and in some of the older areas and maybe the, I don't know, where do they run? They'll have to figure it out or the, maybe it's on the other neighbor side or something. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, typically there'll be storm sewer somewhere um, on the block in front of their house, whether it be on their side of the street or the other side of the street. Um, the city will um, assist in doing things um, in the city right away, um, which will be um, outside of the of the three thousand dollar cost, um, or we could um, we could change it and say that if the city does work on um, the city right away um, will pay a maximum of three thousand dollars when some of that could be um, our cost our internal cost to extend piping or to uh, you know if we have to cut the road open or whatever to get pipe okay. to them and another question so just looking at my backyard let's and I, I'm getting the water because me and my neighbor behind me, we didn't do anything, right? So the water backs up there. So if we start getting that 72 hour threshold and I wanna put a manhole in number one, the utilities are not gonna let me put it right in dead in center. I'm gonna to have to put it into my property. The, the question becomes, there's not enough pitch. There's not enough pitch to go to the front. Does that mean I have to install a pump of some kind, right? I would take it that that would depend on the homeowner right those mm -hmm. costs yeah. and and we're looking at only so a max so if it's a six thousand dollar project we'll give them a three thousand providing if, unless we do work then that gets deducted right yeah. yeah. it's kind of like the generator grant program <laughs> same type of deal that's what we're looking yeah. to strive for here and at thirty thousand we might only get ten residents a year correct so yeah. So if um, yeah, if, if the engineer, the, the your engineer comes out and says, yeah, you don't have enough pitch to do gravity fed uh, storm sewer. You need to do an ejector pump or something. Then that's um, going to be part of your cost, and then we'll uh, reimburse up to three thousand um, uh, dollars, fifty percent of the labor material costs. Um, so yeah, so I mean, whatever you got to do, you could. I mean, if you put the gold-plated, you know, sewer pump back there, and you want to spend fifty thousand dollars, that's awesome. But you're still only going to get three. Old McKellano. Okay, I want to make um, first a, a motion to change it to forty-eight hours instead of seventy-two. Second. Roll call. Or he wants to. He wants to amend the. Well, you want you're making a motion for the whole thing. And yeah. Amending, amending it, make the, the whole thing and thing amending, amending it to, it to uh, 70 to 43, 48 to 72. So there's a motion to approve the rear drainage pro standards minus the 72 to 48. Just procedurally, is I don't remember who made the uh, motion. Maybe the minute taker was there a motion? I don't no, think there was. was. No, there no, there was. He was. The, that's why I'm just saying he's got to okay. make the whole motion, the mm -hmm. whole thing. Correct. Yeah. He's been saying yes. So the motion would be to approve the uh, rear yard drainage assistance program uh, with the 48-hour uh, uh, eligibility requirement. Instead Correct. Of 72, right? There was a second. Mr. Woods, what what does uh, constitutes standing water? That's what I was going to Storm water. Is that no, no, no. But one foot by one foot square, or the guy's whole backyard. So th this is part of the guy's whole backyard. Well, there's one guy. He's going to say right. But not since pass we're the making the standard, guy. I get what you're trying to solve. Right. I, I understand that. But what I'm trying to stave off is everybody that's got you know. Three square feet of a water low, that's a low in spot. one back yeah. corner of their lot. No. That no. that that's covered. So is there yeah. language to cover what? Because if the, so, if there's damage or threat to the structure and home flooding, that counts. It doesn't matter how many hours. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So that picture you're showing me is doesn't matter how many hours. 
is what I'm saying. The 72 is only if there's a water issue that's not impinging on the property or, or jeopardizing the property, correct? No, that's not what they say. We well, that, I think that that's yeah. the way it's written, though. That's the way I understand it. So that's why I'm trying to get a little clarity. Is it? Yeah. Mr. Brown? Yeah, I mean, the, the way that it was, uh, it was uh, pre prepared was that here's a criteria for you to consider. It still requires, and we excluded certain things, but it still requires the uh, city, upon a request by the resident as part of the program requirements, that the Public Works Department is going to meet with that resident, assess the problem. So those low standing, you know, where you've got a, a small area in the backyard, in the back year, backyard that happens to have some standing water, a determination will be made that there's not a solution for that. A rear yard drain system is not right. applicable to, uh, to that. Right. But so my, the, the, the larger question is, so it says direct damage to structure or home flooding, right? So that's the home. Is that then comma and also standing water for over 72 consecutive hours? I think it's comma that, or and or and or. So it has right. to be a Wooddale resident, and then they have to meet one of those next three standards. So right. we'll, so we'll the readjust. Water, the, right. We'll, is readjust. entering the house or infringing on the, the foundation. So that's one thing. They don't have to wait 72 hours if the water's... Yeah. Is that correct then? Yeah. yeah. And one of the, and so, the. So it should, so. So. I, that's why I wanted to make that clear, because I know why you were lowering we that, that, but I, I, I think that they were irrespective of each other. One is one thing. Yeah, it wasn't intended that you had to satisfy all of those. So what, uh, it doesn't require any, um, any change to the motion, but we would, uh, then suggest that it read under the criteria for cost sharing participation that it be one Wooddale resident only and one of the following criteria overland stormwater that causes direct damage to structures home or standing water for over 72 hours or multiple residential homes uh, are impacted. On with Catalano. Then I'll change my motion, keep it at 72 hours. As long as I know that the structure, if the water's going into the person's basement, that then they can take advantage of this uh, cost sharing. And so I'll change my motion. Second or uh, yes. accept that. Mayor. I do have one question, though. Going back to what Alderman was just saying, what constitutes, is the water in my swale covering my feet, or is it just soggy and wet and little water on the top? Water is supposed to be in a swale, correct? You know, I mean, how do we, because I'm going to complain that, oh, I got a little standing water there. It's about this much. I can't cut my grass in that corner. I'm upset. Does that constitute a problem? Well, it wouldn't under the, uh, it, what it would do is it would prompt the public works director to go out there and if an engineer was necessary to get to uh, accompany the public works department, they would do that and make that determination as to whether or not that has an impact. And I think the determination, it has an impact on whether you can cut your grass and right. that falls I'm, under, I'm right. No, I'm, but I'm, I'm saying that would I not. I call for that, but I'm sure, saying but that some, would be, somebody but, might. But <laughs> residents certainly might, but that would not uh, raise it to eligible for participation in the program. And again, it's a new program, so you're going to have, you know, there's, there are going to be those people who, you know, I, I just lost four segments of fence because my neighbor's property drains onto mine and it rotted them out over the course of time. But, you know, so they're going to get people who are always going to, to call. But the, that's why the, the uh, you know, there's a limit in the budget as to how much. There's a limit per property owner, and it's going to be with consultation with the uh, Public Works uh, uh, Department uh, so that, that that site determination can be made. And, you know, once we go through a rainy season, it may be that we're back here with some uh, minor modifications that we found. Here's what we're seeing. Here's really where the problems are. And here's the ones that aren't problems that are very minimal. But everybody wants, you know, you want a dry backyard. I get it. Dry front yard, side yard, and so forth. So, Alderman Jacob. Uh, this is going to the attorney. So going for over four and a half years now, people from Cedar have been coming in here complaining about water problems. And you've always said that we cannot touch the utility easement, but 
unless I'm mistaking, you said we will attempt to work with the utility easement. So everybody from Cedar could come in here, apply for this grant if they qualify and meet some of this criteria. <coughs> and now we're going to contact the utility company. I'm well looking confused on that issue. Mr. Bond. Yeah, no, we, we would certainly try to work with the utility. We don't have any control if it's another utility. If it's our utility, we have absolute control over our utility easements. And we have many easements throughout the city that we have uh, that are in favor of the city that we maintain and have control over. To the extent that there's easements that are involving other utilities, we would certainly try to work with those other utilities, as could the, the property owner. We can't go in and alter that other easement, that other utility easement on our own. We can on our own, utility, the easements that are in favor of the city. If somebody grants us and we have access to rear yards for drainage and so forth in many instances uh, throughout the city, and we have the absolute right to address those. But the people on Cedar presumably could uh, come in. The problem with some of the, the property owners that came in, the, the ones that I spoke to, uh, and, and assess their situation. They were just lower. They were the topography. They were lower than the adjacent properties. So that was where the water was going to, to go. It had nothing to do with the engineering or or a, or an easement. It was that was the the nature of their property. And in some instances, the adjacent properties were altered to change the topography. Do a follow up. Alderman Roy Wesley. So. Pat, explain how this would work along for the people along the creek then, because the creek is up for 72 hours in their backyard too. So does that? Attorney Bob. Yeah, I mean, they, <laughs> they could certainly contact us to determine whether or not they're eligible for participation <clears throat> in the program. It's not restricted to uh, any particular area, so they would be eligible. I would think every house on that along the creek would be eligible for it. Is there a stipulation in there? For what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Is there a stipulation in there for if you're on the creek or anything? There's no. not. No. Okay. No. The, the, the problem with that issue is that what we're trying to do is take the water out of the backyards and get it into the storm sewer system. When you put the water in the storm sewer system, it's got to go somewhere, which means it's got to go to the creek. It's just going to go so, back and yeah. forth. So it's not really going to solve their problem. Um, Roy what, or Eugene Wesley. So the lake that I always get in my backyard <coughs> that every year I, I could put fish in my lake back there and fish for the day because the water sits there for so many days. Am I qualified for that position? <laughs> Not from Mount Himalaya in your backyard, your neighbor. You know, yeah. I mean, as a resident, you're eligible for participation okay, thank you. in yeah. other programs. You, it would, you'd have to satisfy the same yeah, that criteria. The other end is you. No, you're Old not. You're not. The other thing is, uh, if there's um, an easement buildup from the residents who put a structure on their easement, then they should be uh, not eligible, right? Correct? Is that what's going to be in here? Because there is a lot of residents that I've seen in my ward, that they go ahead and they put a shed or start putting, um, building up dirt there. So that, that should disqualify them, correct? I mean, that's part of the, the site uh, assessment determination. The biggest problem you have, and I, I spent a number of years at the county prosecuting those illegal fills, it's hard to prove, you know, that somebody over time didn't drop their grass clippings or add, you know, mulch or dirt or whatever to build the property up because we don't have a, uh, now with drones maybe we will, but we don't have a snapshot of the topography of before and after. So generally what happens is over time, People will do that, and some of them, some people do it intentionally, and some of them do it inadvertently. You, you build, you put in a deck, you have some piers, you take that dirt, and you just spread it around your yard. Over time, that's going to change the topography. And again, if somebody doesn't, it's going to, they'll end up being lower on that, uh, on the topography, and the water seeks the the path of least resistance, which is the lowest level. But it, but if the swale, if there was a swale that was developed and on the Plata survey. It shows a swale as a stormwater structure. Um, one of the ineligible costs is maintenance and repair of existing stormwater systems. So if we could declare there that they're not utilizing their storm sewer system properly, then we may be able to deny. Hello, Messina. I know you've talked in a 
couple different points. I mean, in reality, you bring, everyone's bringing up these crazy scenarios. Knock your socks off. If you're watching at home. If you have something that's an odd scenario, bring it here. It's going to cost you probably a lot more than $3,000. But just like the generator program, we're willing to help. We're not willing to fix your problem 100%. We're willing to help, and that's what this was intended for. So if you got an oddball and you don't want to go fishing, bring it up. I'm sure it's going to be more than $3,000, but essentially this helps. Um, my only thing and clarification as we rewrite this or as we write this is the utility easements has always been a sticky subject, and I just want to make sure that it's very clear that the city will not take over ownership of that process, that the burden falls on the resident and if they do not grant us an easement, that is not us. That's not a city problem. That is a problem that you yourself, as a resident, need to work through. Well, that's the city utility, not the right. And, and maybe I, I was speaking of when you made reference. We cannot, if someone doesn't give the city the right to go on their property, they don't give us an easement. We cannot go on private property. So if that was, uh, I'm sorry, Alderman so, Jacob, if that was uh, the source of your your inquiry. But if it's a utility easement that we have in our favor, we can. But that, the program does not uh, does not currently contemplate that under the language that's okay. being contemplated. So just, this can be very clear because we have a lot of people that fall under this. If I have a resident in their backyard that has flooding, and theoretically it's caused by ComEd utility, throw that out there, they don't qualify or they need to negotiate and get the get approval for access before we will come to a site assessment. Could you clarify? Um, if they're having a problem, we will, and they apply to be a part of the program, we will meet with them and discuss with them what the problem are, how they're getting their water, where their water's coming from, and then we will go through if it's from a ComEd um, drainage issue, if it's, um, you know, an easement, um, a 10-foot easement for, um, you know, Comcast line is different than their house backing up to the high tension lines. So those are two, di two totally different things. So we will work through each, each one of these cases is going to be different. They're all going to have different idiosyncrasies about them. So we will have to look, look at each one of them and be able to explain to them why they're having the water and if there's something we can do to help them. Okay, just one last comment then. You, you have the manpower and the hours to do this. With, it becomes very menial, but you don't have an hour to take pictures of street signs. This is where I go back to the nonsense. So you have the time to take every single damn case that comes up. You're going to go on site and give an assessment, but you don't have an hour to take pictures of that. This, this is why I, no I get frustrated with staff. Mr. Mr. That's Nervous. not what he said. He didn't say he had the time. He's going to do it because you're telling him to do it. If you tell him to do the you pictures, apply, he's going to do it. You go, if you apply, we come do a site assessment, no matter what. You're going to have ridiculous requests come in, I'm sure. But we don't have a choice because that's you the problem. Don't have, you guys are tight for man hours, but you don't, you don't have an hour to take pictures that could take five minutes to upload. I, just that's, be careful what you say because we're going to that's still not documenting he, all the... That's not what he's saying. That's don't have the manpower. Do have the manpower. We do. We don't. That's it. But that's Mr. not what he Mr. Sorrentino. Well, thank you, Alderman uh, Susmarski. Uh, all of this water issue and standing water, I would seriously request a 10-minute recess for a little pause for the cause. I think we could all use it to stand up, and maybe our minute taker here could use a break, too, and come back maybe at 10, 15. Yeah, okay? We don't need a motion for that, do we? I call the no. question. Long. Yeah, no, we, could, we could vote on it and then go on. Yeah, recess. call the question. Sure. Call the question and okay. vote. Roll call, please. So what's the motion? It's the same as it is. It was to approve it. The way it's written is the way it is. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman Messina? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Sorrentino? Yes. Alderman Murray Wesley. Yes. So it was a recess for 10 minutes. Thank you.